Ready, set, go!
Thank you for your patience, the stream will be starting soon. I was not expecting that beep sound to happen. <laughs> I haven't done a countdown to start my streams before. I did not realize it was going to make such a loud beep. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. How's it going? Uh, for those of you wondering what the heck is going on. Hi, I'm Wallaber. I am an independent game creator, developer, etc. Uh, and all this week, the official Godot Engine Twitch channel has been doing takeover streams where different streamers have been kind of doing their regular streaming content, but here on the Godot Engine official channel. I am uh, number four for this takeover week. Uh, like I said, I'm, my name is Wallaber. I'm an uh, independent game developer. Uh, thank you, Godot Engine official. Yeah, you can type exclamation point streamer in the chat to get some info. You can also see on the side there some of the different games I've worked on and stuff. Uh, the most, if you've heard of something I worked on, it's probably either Where's My Water, which was like a fairly popular puzzle game back in the early mobile app store era, 2011, uh, or the Jelly Car series of games, of which the most recent game is called Jelly Car Worlds, which uh, came out 20, 20, late 2022, something like that. Anyway, 
uh, my current project, which I just played a bunch of video from, and you can also see over there, is called Parking Garage Rally Circuit. Most people have a hard time remembering the name of this video game I'm working on. Uh, but that it's a it's a parking garage rally circuit. That's that's what you do in the game. That's what I decided to call it. Um, so many people in the chat already. This is exciting. I don't know if I could say hello to everyone, but definitely some people that hang out in my streams have been dropping by. I appreciate that. Also, a bunch of fellow streamers are in the chat. Irish John Games. I think I saw Cricket. I think I saw who else that also streams game dev. I really love streaming, working on game development. So I've met a lot of really great people who also stream working on their games. And it's one of the more uh, amazing communities I've ever been lucky enough to be a part of. So Captain Coder's in here. I'm sure I'm missing people because I'm scrolling up and down here. But um, let's see. So basically, uh, let me show the game real quick. Okay. But today, um, normally on my streams, I am like actively working on my game. That was kind of loud. Maybe we'll turn that down a little bit. What do y'all think? Uh, normally on my streams, <laughs> I am actively working on the game. But today, since I get to do this takeover, I thought it might be kind of fun to just sort of do a show and tell. Um, this game is almost done. It's going to be coming out in September. This is my first proper uh, Godot game. I've been making games for tw 25 years or something like that. A uh, very long time. But uh, this is my first proper Godot game. And so I thought people might be curious. Like, what, you know, how to use... What is a larger... It's not a big game, but it's like a proper commercial game. Uh, you know, what does the project look like? How is it set up? Um, and I thought that might be kind of fun to just answer any questions people have about anything in the game. I can show you any of the code. I can show you any of the assets. We can talk about shaders. We can talk about, you know, every little tiny thing in the game. Nothing is off limits. Uh, but let me, real quick, let me just show you the video game. So, as you can probably tell, this game is... Uh, low res <laughs> uh intentionally so so this game is trying to look and feel like a sega saturn game and so i put a lot of effort into trying to make the game feel like an authentic sega saturn game so we can talk about that a little bit how i've achieved that visual style in godot um but yeah as you can see it's a it's a precision driving racing game the controls are very Mario Kart-y in terms of you have a button to drift, and then while you're drifting, you can kind of steer relative, um, and you get boosts from doing drifts. I assume you achieved it through a shader. Yeah, I can uh, I can show that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different tracks. Let's go to another one. Oh, we can't hear the... Uh, that's interesting. Ah, I think something's up with my volume. Because the voice is like basically gone when I turn it down. <laughs> I can kind of hear it. Interesting. Oh, it might be like downstream of sound effects. Oh, I think it is. I think I've got my buses set up wrong. We can go look at that. I'm pretty sure that I have the voice set as like underneath the sound effects bus. So this is setting the overall volume. And then this is like the relative volume, which is probably not the way it should be. Let's see. There we go. Uh, so anyway, here's another track. As you can see, you drift, you get sparks, you boost. If you start another drift before the old boost ends, you can sort of chain the boost, and actually the top speed of the car is unlimited, which is kind of fun. Woo! Uh, you remember playing Where's My Water when you were younger? Thanks, cool. Yeah, I was the lead designer of Where's My Water. 
Uh, so I was heavily involved in that game, you know, sort of helped come up with the concept. Ugh. And um, designed a bunch of the levels and stuff like that. Yeah, this game is very... Uh, you can see there's like a ghost here. See the like golden car? That car represents the gold trophy. If I can beat that car, I, I like get gold for this level. This track, I should say. Um, and then after that, if I beat the... After beating the gold, I can switch to... Uh, ghosts that come down from the leaderboard. So maybe if I can take a little shortcut here. There we go. Actually, did I... Did I turn on Steam? I don't think I turned on Steam, so we're probably not going to get any leaderboards right now. Let me make sure Steam is booted up. There we go. Apparently Plants vs. Zombies is on sale. Is this going to load, or will I need to quit out? I think I'll need to quit. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. I think you nailed the car feel. How is the mini-map code and setup? Yes, let me write that down. So I'm going to keep track of what people want to see. So I make sure I cover everything. Uh, let me see. Let me, is there anything else I wanted to show? Um, so we have leaderboards. As you can see here, we got leaderboards. Currently, I am 26th on this track. And so if we go to race this track, it's going to automatically download the ghosts of the other players near me in the leaderboard. So here you can see these are ghosts of actual players from Steam, from my playtest that I've been doing. You can see that they take a shortcut right there. Let's see if we can keep up with them. So I can talk a little bit about how the leaderboards work, uh, the car physics... We can talk about uh, how the ghosts and the replay system work. Um, you know, input, uh, UI, shaders, anything people want to see. So please uh, don't hold back. Ask questions, and I'm going to stop showing the game here, and we'll just start taking a tour through the project. Let me see if I can beat at least a couple of these players. Uh oh. Okay, okay, okay. Ah! Gah! Okay. Does the game censor inappropriate Steam names? No, it doesn't do anything beyond whatever Steam would do. Definitely interested in your shader and the ghost leaderboard. Okay, cool. The physics are not deterministic. I'm using Jolt. Um, yeah, and we can talk about uh, Steam as well. So here you can see this is the replay of the race we just did. I have a completely nerdy replay system where I can actually, like, we can pause, we can rewind, we can fast forward. I can actually move back and forth through time by rolling the right stick. Uh, you can switch to different cameras, of course. So here's, like, the in-game camera. Uh, here's, like, a car relative camera. So you can sort of, like, make, make whatever shot you want, you know. And then here's, of course, free cam. So you can just, like, fly around. So we could uh, we could go look at this jump right here or something. Huh. This is really, really helpful for making trailers and stuff as well. Um, so I can show you how I've made this replay system. But I really would, would encourage most people to try and add a replay system to their game if they can because it adds so much. Like here I could be like, oh, this is a great shot for the trailer. Look at this. You know? <laughs> yeah because we're not recording a video we're just recording almost like an animation of what happened in the game and playing it back which is why you can go back and look at it from different angles oh look here's a nice bug look at this clipping look at that I'd love to see about any any in editor visualization tools okay yeah let me write that down um, yeah, so anyway, that's the game. So let's get into what people wanted to know. Um, debug slash visualization tools. Okay. Let's see. Did anyone ask anything else that I need to catch up on? Uh, replays. So we have the replays. We'll talk about replays. 
Quality parking lot construction. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the Lazy Kitty. Uh, yeah, I'm using Steam for leaderboards and the ghost replay data. Yeah, I'm actually using uh, Godot Steam. I don't know if everyone knows about Godot Steam. This right here. Uh, so Godot Steam is a like a community managed uh, project for implementing Steam features into your Godot projects. Uh, the way there's like multiple ways you can implement it. One is where you just grab the code, you actually compile the engine from source, and you add the Godot Steam into it, so that your version of the editor has Steam, the Godot Steam stuff in it. Um, otherwise. I have a pick that I wanted to share with you that I think you'll find really interesting. Do you have a Discord? I do have a Discord. Yeah, it's just discord.gg slash Wallaber. Um, or you can just find my username Wallaber on Discord. Um, but there's also different ways that you can do. Yeah, you can compile it yourself or you can uh, drop it in as like a like a GD native plugin or whatever. But anyway, I am using Godot Steam. I can show the implementation of that a little bit more if people have questions about that. Uh, so let's see, where should we start? I guess people probably kind of curious about the basic setup of the car. Um, uh, so maybe we can start with that. So I, the car is actually made up of two pieces. There's this thing called car rig. Uh, oh, yes, this is Godot. Yeah, I'm going to give you the basics. This is a Godot 4.2, and I am using Jolt physics. Although, to be honest, I started this project using Godot physics, and I didn't have any particular problems with Godot physics. It's just that everyone kept saying that uh, um, Jolt is more performant and is going to become the default in future Godot releases. And so I thought, okay, we might as well try Jolt. And so I've been using Jolt, and it's great. Um, uh, let's see. Speaking of commercial stuffs, when is the new... Go oh, I, I don't know. That, that's a question for the Godot official. Because <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. We'll be curious as to any optimization issues you've encountered. So the game is pretty simple, and I haven't had too many. Um, uh, no, I haven't contributed anything yet to Godot. I haven't run into anything troublesome enough that I need to uh, actually like make a pull request or something like that. Um, I would say the one thing I added almost immediately, someone asked about this, so let me show this real quick. One of the things I added, let me see, is there a quick way to, yeah. Hey Slacks, how's it going? Ready, set. Good lord, that was loud. You have a strong computer because on my computer, modern demo don't run, really. I've had hundreds of playtesters of this game, so I don't think it requires much in terms of computer, but you know, it does require some. It's a 3D game after all. So one thing you can see here, if I play the scene directly, when I make when I collide with things, do you see those little pink lines that are showing up? See, I hit the wall, there's a pink line. I hit the wall, there's a pink line. So these little pink lines right here. This is something I added, which is kind of a, uh, I was surprised that Godot didn't have, which is a simple way to just draw lines in 3D. So you could say, hey, is my raycast going in the right spot? Where did this collision happen? What was the normal? Stuff like that. Uh, so these little lines you see here are what, actually one of the very first things I wrote which is my debug draw. Amazingly, Godot makes it pretty dang easy to add stuff like this. That Those debug lines are 71 lines of code. Um, so I made a little script called... Oh, I didn't even give it a class name. That's that, that's how long ago I wrote it. I usually write... I usually add a class name for everything these days. Um, but this is debug draw, which basically is just a way so that you can call draw a line with a position in in the scene, a start and an end position and a color and how long you want that line to show up. And um, all that does is put this information into a little dictionary and then in process it updates a uh, immediate mesh. 
immediate mesh, which is set up to be lines and just basically runs through all the data, decrements the lifetime, and then updates the surface. So it's not particularly efficient. If you have thousands and thousands of lines, this will slow down, but this is really easy to just draw some debug lines. I, of course, have this set up as an auto load right here, debug draw. So there's a quick, that's a quick thing I made so I could, you know, do some visualization, which I, I rely on a lot um, for 3D stuff. You know, you need to be able to draw a line so you can debug things. Alexander Blender, URP or HDRP? Those are, those are Unity terms. Um, for the renderer I'm using in Godot, I'm currently using the mobile renderer. The mobile renderer. No particular reason I'm choosing that. I don't need uh, the forward plus. I don't need a lot of the more fancy lighting and stuff for this game. So I picked kind of the middle of the road mobile one, which is Vulcan, but, you know, it's pretty simple. Because um, I'm doing all the lighting and stuff on my own anyway. Uh, so that wasn't, I, that was, I don't know. Again, I'm not, an, I'm not a Godot expert. I'm just learning. So there's probably some things about this project that I would set up differently on the next project. Um, but yeah, anyway, okay, so debug lines. This is the kind of thing that personally I would love I would love to add this into the Godot engine natively so that it could be really high performance. Um, and after this project, I, I would actually try like to try and make a proposal to add a feature like this built in because it's so incredibly useful to be able to visualize stuff while the game is running in 3D. Positions, you know, lines between things, normals, that kind of stuff. It's really, really, really useful. Um, and as far as I know, there's no built-in way to do that. So yeah. Anyway, um, I was going to go over a little bit how the car works. The car... So I guess I should start by saying, if we look at one of the cars. Let's look at this car. Okay, here's the car. Uh, as you can see... It is a rigid body um, and I'm not using any built-in car stuff. Um, I, it's just a rigid body. It's a rigid body that then has a bunch of graphics associated with it. And uh, there, here you can see what the collider looks like. The collider is very simple. And I've tried to sort of shape the collider to kind of match the car but also to react well when you hit walls and things. So it's very simplified. The Collider is a Cybertruck. Oh my gosh. Big reveal. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a rigid body. If you want to see the script for the car, there's not much to it, actually. It's only... 300 lines um, but that's because the physics in this game are weird they are not realistic at all so essentially what I do is I have a car that shoots ray casts down and does suspension so the car like you know bounces and reacts and if you go over a bump you know it'll it'll react from that and that's what this script is doing but this script has no concept of um, steering, acceleration, anything. There's a separate script that basically pushes the car around um, and kind of puppeteers the car. So I can explain that a little bit more. It's actually kind of hard to explain, um, but it is the key of, to this game. So if you look at this, there's most of the stuff here is like making it so that you can set the colors and the numbers on the car, like visual things. This just visually sets the steering angle of the tires. Is it, it's more a platformer like that taxi game? Um, yeah, kind of, yeah. Like a uh, yellow taxi goes vroom. I remember your jelly car devlogs. Do you have devlogs on this game? No, uh, people, not very many people watch the devlogs. So I, I haven't really made any for this game. I post lots of videos about the making of this game, but they're all TikTok videos and YouTube shorts and posts on Twitter. I don't have any like long form stuff. Uh, but if you look like basically 
right here, physics process. So really all this car does is some suspension. Uh, it loops over each tire and says, update your shock. And so if you look uh, back at the, back here, you can see that there's actually, uh, actually we just go up here. You can see that um, these, Are they here? They're here. Uh, there's these uh, nodes that represent each tire. Um, and they have a script on them that says, that's the rally car tire. And this is a script that does suspension. So basically it does a raycast, uh, but I'm doing a raycast directly right here. Um, I'm not using the raycast node I could explain why I'm not using the raycast node if anybody's curious, but basically I do a raycast at from the position of the tire pointing down, and then I remember what I hit stuff, and then later there is a uh, right here update shock, which is going to actually apply a force onto the rigid body. So basically, rigid body for the car, four raycast shooting down that apply suspension. You can kind of think of the car actually as a hovercraft. It's just floating above the ground with based on four little fans pointing down at the ground, basically. And if, if the ground gets too close to any spot, that spot's going to push up a little bit. So the car m bounces and reacts to the ground, but actually doesn't have any, any forces for traction or steering or acceleration or grip. So if the car by itself, if you just pushed it, it would just slide and spin across the world. The reason I'm not using a raycast node is because I wanted to control the order in which the raycast happens. And when you have a raycast node that's a child of another script, of another node with a script on it or something, you're not in direct control of the order that things happen. Um, and I had some issues where the main thing I want to know which I think you'll find it right. It's in update Ray right here. I mostly want to know the distance to the hit point. I don't really care about where we hit in the world. I want to know the distance and um, the Raycast node does not let you ask the distance. It will let you ask, where did you hit? But one thing that can happen is a Raycast node will shoot down and hit the ground, right? Whenever it decides to update, but then the, another script might actually move the object. And so what you have then is an outdated position. And so if you ask this, this Raycast, where did it hit the ground? It's going to tell you about a position that's kind of old. And if I use that position to calculate a distance, that distance will be longer than the truth. Um, and so it worked out better for me in this case to do the Raycast directly myself so that I can remember the distance of the hit point exactly when it happened. So that then later in an update, later, you know, in the frame, when I need to use that information, I know I have accurate information. Why the preference for a ray cast instead of a shape cast? Actually, um, I don't know. Um, I probably could do a shape cast if I wanted to have even more accurate collision. Um, and uh, it would probably be a, a good idea. I would assume a Raycast is slightly better performance. It doesn't really matter for this game because there's only really one car that's live at any given time that's actually doing this code. Uh, but yeah, so the car is basically floating. And then, and then there's a separate script that is puppeteering the car. That's the script that actually does the driving. And so if I show you car rig, here is like, this script is 95%. Can't you just force update Raycast when you need it? Uh, you can, yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. I had it that way for a little while, and then I decided, why not just do the Raycast directly? And so I switched it. I've had it. I've had all three flavors of this. I had Raycast nodes by themselves. I had Raycast nodes where I call force update. I had them turned off to not update on their own, and I call them update when I want. Um, but yeah. Shape cast that rotates to the angle of the wheels. Box wheels. Yeah, that could be cool. <laughs> so this script here is like the main... This is the video game right here. This script is 
is if you think the car driving is cool, um, it's because of this script. 1,300 lines <laughs> of code. Um, but essentially what you're doing in the game, and this is something I learned from analyzing Mario Kart, specifically Mario Kart Wii. I analyzed that game very deeply and came to the conclusion uh, when you're making a car game, you have like, maybe I could draw a picture. When you're making a car game, you kind of have like two options. Um, one is car first, camera second. And the other one is camera first, car second. So, and what I mean by that is, <clears throat> it's kind of like the difference between like, uh, like, GTA and Star Fox. If that makes any sense. So one way to make a to make like a a driving game is you say, okay, well, we're going to be driving around, so we're going to have our car, right? We're going to we're going to de design a car with physics and stuff and steering and whatever. And the player controls will talk to the car. And so when you steer, the tires will steer. And when you say go forward, you know, the tires in the back will push the car and whatnot, right? And you get a car that works with the controls affecting the car. And then later you add in a camera and you tell the camera like, I don't know, hang out behind the car and chase the car around or whatever, right? Common way you would do this is like a spring or something. So like maybe the car turns like this and now it's going this way, right? And um, and now you have this imaginary point back here that where the camera should be, but the camera is like was here from the last frame. And so you apply a spring to pull the camera this way and point the camera this way. Right. You've probably played a driving game where the camera lags behind the car. So you turn around a corner and you have to look at which way the car is pointing and say, oh, is the car pointing down the road? I'll stop steering now and then wait for the camera to come around and line up with the car. Right. That would be an example where almost all games do this, where they make a car that works, controlled by the inputs, and then they add a chase camera or a camera that, you know, follows the car. Okay. Um, I don't think that's how Mario Kart works. At least Mario Kart Wii, I don't think works that way. I think the way Mario Kart Wii works is you are steering the camera. You are flying the camera through the track. And when you steer, you are just turning the camera. So when you say turn left, the camera turns left. And when you stop saying turn left, the camera stops turning left. If you go play Mario Kart, at least Mario Kart Wii, the one I looked at, look at like cover up the car and drive and you will notice that you are steering the camera. You are not steering the cart. And, and so in my point of view, from my point of view, then what they're doing there is you're steering a camera and then there is a cute little cart that is placed in front of the camera so that it looks like you're driving a car. And when you say, yo, let's turn left, they just, the, ca the, the camera starts turning to the left and then they just turn the car relative to the camera. Like, yeah, we're going that way now. You know what I'm saying? So the car is like a little sprite. And if you think about it, the original Mario Kart way back in the day from the Super Nintendo, the car was literally a sprite. You were f guiding a camera through the scene and the ca car was a little sprite that was like, ee, 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 right? And um, that's, I'm pretty sure that is kind of how Mario Kart still basically works. This is one reason that the driving feels so responsive. Because if you just look down where you're headed, and when you let go of the steering stick, you're going to go in the direction you're looking. There's not a long delay where you end up going in a different direction. So, um, so I decided to do this. So in my game, essentially what there is, is there's a secret point in space that is you. And you can kind of imagine it like there's like a, there's like a, like a metal rig like this. And the camera is attached to this thing like this. And the camera's like, woo, where are we going? Right? And then, and then there's like another rig like this. And there's a car, there, your car is here like this. 
This is your cool little Mario Kart car, right? And there's like, uh, hang on. And it's like this, there's like a, oops, oops, oops. There we go. There's like a, a little marionette system with springs attached to the car like this. And so as you're driving around, you're steering the camera. But when you steer to the left, we say, yeah, let's make the car look like it's turned a little bit. And then when you want to go straight, we turn the car back to normal. And then when you drift, we're like, Oh, sorry about that. I think I touched my microphone. So imagine a little kid driving around and going ee, ee, with a little car. That is what this game is doing. You're, you are the kid, the camera, and your hand is holding the car. And you're driving around like this and you go. Er, 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 er. So the car has real suspension with the ground, but then there's these fake forces that are turning the car relative to the screen. So it's a very strange thing. So you're, you are driving. Yeah, I don't know how long my audio is out. Goodness. But yeah, um, you are flying the camera and the car is fake. Kind of fake. So essentially, I have two scripts. I have the rally car itself, <clears throat> which is just the car with suspension. And then I have my car rig script which is the, the camera and the crazy stuff. So if we scroll down into like f the physics process here, you're gonna see that we do a lot. Here's the physics process. This is the physics process of my game. <laughs> so you can see like, here we go. Where's the actual steering? Let's see. Now the steering's up in regular process, I think. So here we're trying to work out what speed we want to be going, if we have the brakes turned on. Then if we're on the ground, we eventually apply a force to the car to push it forward and backward. And then here's grip, which is the sideways force so that we don't slide sideways. And then here, right here and here is where we fake by we turn the car relative to the screen to make it look cool <laughs> so yeah um that's the that's the core concept so now if i play the game again real quick you it might look a little different to you now if you now that you know how it works so right here you see this when the car falls that's the that's just the physics of the car doing its suspension, right? That's the suspension. That's the real ray casts and suspension on the car. But then if we go into a race, so right now, when I turn left, I'm just steering the, ca the camera. If I let go, we go in the direct, exact direction the camera is pointing. There's no delay. Can you see the car turning a little bit? That's fake. Those, that's a torque on the car to make it turn a little bit in the direction that you're turning. And when you drift, I just make that way more uh, exaggerated. So here you can see like the shocks are holding the car up. Other forces are pushing the car forward and doing the drifting. And then a torque on the car rigid body is making it point in the direction I want to make it look like you're doing a sweet drift, basically. I don't know why I'm getting all these stutters today. I must I must have like too many tabs open or something. <clears throat> Does vertical behave the same? Well, it's a mixture also. So one thing I also do, if you look at this car here, I have this body rotation offset. And so what I do is like when you're drifting, I'd go like this. 
and when you get a boost, I go brr, brr, and I, this is just like code. I don't know if the initial D games work the same way, but there are definitely uh, one thing you can definitely do when you're playing a driving game, and I would recommend you do this: is get like a index card or something. Oh, that's the, sorry, my green screen does not like this color. Maybe there's a color it doesn't mind. Get an index card and put it up on the screen and cover the car. And then play the game. And you'll be able to tell right away, am I controlling the car and the camera is following or am I controlling the camera? And I think often the difference between an arcade game and a simulation game can be, can be, you can, be, you can see that pretty easily. But yeah, I do a bunch of stuff on top that's not even the physics. I, I, I tilt this thing like this. I tilt it like this to make it look more exciting when you're driving the car. That is in here if we look for body tilt. So right here we have a tilt and a roll that we want to apply to the car, which we ultimately set right here. And this is based on some curves. Oh, this is another thing I could show actually is um, custom resources. I use a ton of custom resources in this game. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Are there any other? Are there any other quick uh, questions related to the car, or the car physics stuff? Let me show you how many parameters I use to tune out the cars. Okay. If you direct your attention over here to this side of the screen, I have this thing called car parameters which is a script. This is a, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. This is a custom resource that just exposes like a million different parameters related to the cars. And um, so if you look at that in practice over here, basic car acceleration and deceleration. What is the car's top speed going forward? 17 meters per second. How much acceleration does the power does the car have? This is a curve. The way this works is zero is when you're at a standstill. One is when your car is at its top speed, which is this value here. And so I take the current car speed, divide by the top speed. That gives me a number between zero to one. Then I look that up into this to see um, how much power the car should have. This is kind of like the engine's power curve. Uh, how fast can you go backwards? Same thing for going in reverse. Uh, some different controls to decide how much friction or how much force is applied. Um, here's drifting. You got to be going 10 meters per second to start a drift. At least once you started a drift, if you drop below six meters per second, you'll stop drifting. When you're drifting, how quickly can you turn the camera? If you turn the camera sharp, it turns at 130 degrees per second. Otherwise, 90. Otherwise, 60 if you're counter steering. Um, this is the uh, this is a spring that controls the forward directional angle of the car. That's for smoothing. Um, here's all the steering parameters. Here's all the I was talking about the tilt and roll. This is the tilt and roll. So like when you're drifting, it tilts four degrees left and right, but also adjusts that a little bit with some roll and all that kind of stuff. I use these curves a lot. You can see here in this custom resource i use curves very frequently i did say there's no max speed so this is so this is the default max speed if you just hold gas and drive the car uh, but there's also boosting so if you boost for 0.9 seconds or sorry if you drift for 0.9 seconds you will get a boost that increases your top speed by one meter per second and lasts for one second. Or if you boost for 1.6 seconds, you will go up by two meters per second and that lasts for two seconds. And those values stack. So there's a value that's, uh, let me find it. Um, it's in here, it's a uh, boost top, whoops. Boost top, boost top speed. So basically, if we look at this thing, whoops, 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 whoops. There we go. Boost top speed. Uh, yeah, oh, oops, go back one. Oh, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. There we go. Uh, boost top speed. So right here, 
in our physics update, we're trying to decide how fast we wish we were going. By default, we're going to go the car's top speed. But if the boost is active, we're going to use a different number. And this number gets incremented right here whenever we apply a boost. Yes, this is, snaking is pretty big deal, although you get a bigger boost from longer drifts. And I can basically tune that by changing these thresholds here, all these numbers here. Um, so let me just show that since, since, since the topic came up. <clears throat> Car rig is the one applying the force forward, applying the drift, movement, and so on. That's correct. Yeah, so the position of the camera comes from the rigid body of the car, which has the suspension, but all the forces acting to push the car and slide it through the world are coming from car rig, which is all based on the direction the camera is facing. Maybe that's the cleanest way that I could explain it. So here, let me show you what it looks like to stack the drifts or stack the boost. Okay. So if we go, you can see right now I'm going 53, 54 kilometers per hour. That's the top speed of this car, right? But then if I do a drift and then get a boost, now we're going 58. Do a drift, get a boost. Now we're going 60 or so. But if that boost, if the boost end, stops, then I go back to the regular top speed of the car, right? So now it's good. 60 uh, back to 54. But you can stack them. So if I do a drift, boom, do a drift, boom. And before this drift runs out, I couldn't quite get it. Let's do a long drift here. Boom, now we're boosting. Do another drift. Boom, do another drift. Boom, do another drift. Boom, now we're doing 70. Do a long one. Boom, now we're doing 78. Let's do a whole drift all the way around this corner here. Now we're doing 80. Come around here. Now we're doing 87. So there is no upper limit to this other than just that you might crash. So this game is very much about chaining drifts, yes. That's the core mechanic of this game. Uh, drifting, while you're drifting, it does slow you down a little bit. So look, uh, if you watch here, we're going to get up to like 54 or whatever, right? And then while I'm drifting, it drops down to 48 and then boost. So there is like a speed reduction during the drift, which also means, you know, you don't, there are times when you want to actually just take advantage of the boost and don't drift. So you get a bunch of speed through a section of the track. But you need to keep chaining the boosts if you want to uh, really reach high speeds. So that's kind of where the skill comes in in the game. Woo! Is it possible to flip the car upside down? Yes, absolutely. Uh... And I have a whole thing that um, puts the car back on its wheels. So let me see if I can flip the car here. Oh, <laughs> well, okay. That was a little bit uh, weirdly ideal. And then boom, it's back on its wheels. Um, so I can show you that. Actually, that's kind of fun. That's in uh, that's in car rig, I think. Or where is it? Uh... Right here, apply friction and back to wheels. So here what we do is we look and see Da, 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 da. Where's the back to wheel stuff? So right here, I do a bunch of code where I try to figure out if the car is on its side or upside down. So then down here, I can say if the if the car is upside down, okay, and we're going slow enough. So if you flip upside down, you have to slow down and then the car will flip back over. And then we try and figure out which way we want to roll you and we apply a torque to, to flip the car back over. <laughs> so in the air, you can like do barrel rolls and stuff but if you hit the ground and slide it'll like put you back on your wheels but it waits until you slow down enough so that there's been some penalty for flipping over um okay so what should we talk about next some people were asking about the visuals of the game maybe we should talk about the visuals a little bit unless there's other questions about the physics or the car can't believe I got so excited I, I toggled my mic and, and was just animatedly talking for like 15 seconds there. Do you control the car in the air? Yeah. Hey, Gummy Worm, how's it going? Uh, yeah. Um, so let's see. Let's look at um, turn speed, is it? Where, what is it? Uh, 
Oh, I'm in the wrong script. Let's go to car. Let's go to car rig. The beefy script of the video game. Um, let's see, where is that? I basically have a value so I can decide how much you can steer in the air. And you steer like a, a reduced amount. But you can still steer the camera in the air a little bit. But we don't... Um, you can steer the camera in the air, but you're still going to keep flying in the direction you were going until you land. Uh, because the uh, the grip... Right. Turning... Here we go. Max turn speed is going to... Right here. So I have an in-air turn speed factor, which decides how much we should reduce your ability to turn the camera when you're in the air. But then also when we do the grip force, which is right here, we only apply the grip force if you're in the on the ground. Um, so when you're mid-air, you can turn the camera, but you're going to keep flying the direction you were flying. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let me begin to look at the visuals a little bit. Uh, so... The game is trying to look like a Sega Saturn game. And um, I basically pull that off with like a few different pieces. Number one, I render the game to a low resolution. Uh, and so actually, if you look at my main scene, like here's the actual whole, uh, let's see. Here's the whole game window. But then I have this thing called game root, which is the actual game itself. And this is gonna get placed and scaled in the center of the screen. Um, and we have a, a, a viewport here that renders to a certain resolution. And if you look at game setting, no, it's just, it's just do game main. So if you look at game main, I have some code here to place everything. The reason is, by the way, uh, Godot has some really nice tools for like pixel art games and stuff to decide how they fill the screen and everything. So you can have a pixel art game that renders at a certain resolution and then just decide how it fills the screen. I don't exactly do that. And one of the reasons is, uh, see this, how there's like a border around the game and I wanted to have my own graphics in that border and I wanted to be able to have text that's like off this off this virtual game screen. And I wanted to have a bunch of options for the visuals, one of which is should it do pixel perfect scaling or just fill the screen? So pixel perfect, what it does is it figures out what is an integer size that it can uh, take the native game resolution that's the biggest one it can fit in wh whatever resolution your, you know, like monitor is. Um, and we'll limit it to only pixel increments, so 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x. If you set it to fractional, it says whatever, just make it 3.233 or whatever it takes to fill the screen. And I support different aspect ratios as well. So you can play the game in 4x3. Looks like this. Or you can play the game in 16x10, which is like the Steam Deck, or standard 16x9. And so if I set this to this and I set scaling to integer, then you can see like I have to do some work to sort of figure out how big to make this viewport. Even though the game is rendering to a low resolution. Yeah, some Macs have 16 by 10 as well, especially laptops. Actually, a lot of laptops have sim similar to 16 by 10. Um, and so what I do is uh, down here, where is it? It's like refresh window or something. Yeah. So I got to look up what are the resolutions the game runs at. So here are the actual resolutions that the game renders at. Uh, and uh, basically it's 320 by 200, which works out to a perfect 4x multiplier to fill the Steam Deck screen. If you're in 4 by 3, it's 320 by 240. And if you're at 16 by 9, it's 384 by 216. These are all very close to real Sega Saturn resolutions. They're not exactly correct because these aspect ratios were not common during the Sega Saturn. But so anyway, step one, draw the game to a low resolution, which basically means that everything that's actually game content 
is a child of this viewport, which is set to that virtual resolution that I want the game to run at. And then that is scaled to fit the screen by using a, uh, a viewport texture um, to actually you know, lay it out on the screen. Okay, so that's step one, render the game at a low resolution. Uh, step two is to get the like wobble of the vertices and stuff, which was a common thing. And that's a shader. So we can look at the shaders real quick. Um, so I, these, so basically this entire game is custom shaders. I don't really use any, I don't use, in this, in the scenes in the game, there is not a single Godot light. There are no lights anywhere. Um, all the light is baked. And then I have a fake directional light to give dynamic objects a little bit of lighting. But there are no lights in the scene. Um, so if we look at like my basic shader, here's my basic Sega Saturn lit object shader. So uh, there's a bunch of uniforms and stuff for this, but the high level of what this shader does is this is the wobble. This is the, you know, the older systems like PlayStation 1 and Sega Saturn. Um, they, they had lower precision than modern systems do they used fixed point math and so the calculation of 3d points was less accurate which is why things sort of snapped and wobbled around as the camera moved it, they would like resolve to different points right and so the way you simulate that in a modern engine is to pretend you have less resolution than you do um, and you do that by essentially snapping the points to like a kind of a grid in view space essentially so that's basically what, it, actually it's in clip space, I think, but that's all this is doing. This is essentially saying how, what's this like fake grid? Where do the positions want to be? And then snap them to this like weird grid in in, in 3D. Uh, so that's what we do. We snap the positions and then I get the normal so that I can do some lighting. Um, but there's the lighting is really simple. It's basically just, uh, where is it? Right here, we're just doing a dot between a hard-coded light direction and the normal of this particular, you know, uh, vertex. Um, and then we send that down as a value called L and we multiply that with the color. The other cool thing in this game is the transparency or the lack of transparency. There's basically no alpha alpha transparent, semi-transparent surfaces in the game. So right there, if you look at the shadow of the car, you see that the shadow of the car is actually um, what's called a dither pattern. It looks like a checkerboard. So the pixels are either on or off. So anytime I wanna make something that looks like it's kind of, you know, translucent. Um, this was a common technique specifically on the Sega Saturn. And so this is one of the reasons the game looks more like a Saturn game than a PlayStation 1 game. Because um, the PlayStation 1 actually could do transparency pretty well, but the Sega Saturn, it was uh, it was more difficult. So a lot of games resorted to a technique like you see here. Uh, so the way that works is if I show you, uh, let's look at, hmm, do I have a good way to show this? Yeah. If you look at this here, this is the thumbnail for a track and we have a mesh for the track and then I have a copy of the mesh for the track that's squished flat. And this has a shader on it that just does on off. Um, and the on off is, I can show that to you back here in the shader. <clears throat> so basically what it does is it has this thing called a Bayer matrix, which is a little two by two grid. And um, it basically has like weights so a value of 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. And then what you do is you need to figure out where on the screen are you. So you take the screen position of this pixel, multiply it by the size of the viewport so you know where 
an integer values are we on the screen? So this is going to be a number like 120, 30 or whatever. <clears throat> and then we look, we, we, we basically figure out where is that pixel in, in a array of these values. And then we compare our alpha to those values. And then we make the, the pixel either perfectly on or perfectly off. So that's how you get that um, dithering. And basically I support dithering everywhere. So I, the way it, like the way you author it is if you look at this uh, surface material, <clears throat> if you look at how it looks here, if I change this alpha here, so there you can see it's fully black and then it's gonna pop to 75%, then 50, etc. So it's like different tiers of, this, this is a different shader that has I think 16 levels of dithering. Cause it's a four by four grid instead of a two by two. But yeah, that, that's, that's basically how it works. Oops, hopefully I can, there we go. Put everything back the way it was here. Don't save, don't save, don't save. <clears throat> um, let's see, what else? What is the most challenging thing you face when trying to build and publish your first game dev project? Um, finishing. Oh, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uh, game devs in the chat, and I think most of you will agree with me that finishing a project is super freaking hard. And it's hard because most people who like making games like making things, and they like figuring out how to make things, you know, or coming up with the idea. So the first stage of a project is so fun because you're doing the part you enjoy, which is you're figuring out the thing, you're being creative, you're deciding what it's going to be. And the problems you are solving are the types of problems you enjoy. Ooh, how should it work? How should my weird drift system work? How should my weird control idea work where you puppeteer the car or whatever, right? That part is super fun. And then once you go, oh, look at this. This could be a thing from that point until it being in a condition in which you could actually release it for other people to play or pay for is a tremendous amount of other work that has to be done. That is not the same type of work. It's not as fun or as motivating, right? Like, I need to make a replay system. I need to get leaderboards working. I need to make it so that you can remap the controls. I need to make sure that it works with different controllers. I need to make it that if you like, watch this, ready? Um, I need to, yeah, I need to make the UI work on all the different resolutions. I need to get music and get that set up. I need to make all the content in the game, make all the animations in the game. Uh, here you can see, uh, where's a good place to do it? I guess right here, you see where it says, how it says edit colors and it's showing the Z key right now. It's because I touched the keyboard. If I touch this, it's going to flip to that. If I unplug this controller and I plug in an Xbox controller and I fiddle with it, hopefully might take it a second. Now it's a, you know, uh, the Y button, right? Unplug it, use the keyboard. Now it's the Z button. Switch over to a uh, PlayStation controller. And now it's a triangle. Guess who gets to do that, right? That's a, that's annoying, by the way. Uh, Godot makes that relatively easy, but it's still just like something you have to do, you know? I got to make save and load work. I got to make sure it remembers all your stuff. I got to hook up achievements. I got, you know, and so finishing is the hard part by far. <clears throat> The camera in the car rig is inside a viewport as well. So it can be, well, actually the entire uh, scene tree is inside, is, is parented under here. Here, let me, let me actually run the game and I'll show you that. Oh yeah, I can talk about the visual effects a little bit. Yeah, definitely. It's pretty similar. So here, uh, let's go to like a menu or let's go over there's like a 3D thing, like here. So if I go to remote view, you can see that we have our main 
3D viewport, and then here is the car select scene tree, which has all the content in it. So all of that is getting rendered into this viewport at this resolution. And then that is generating a texture, which ends up on the screen due to this uh, texture rect that is referencing the texture from this viewport to display it onto the screen. Does that make sense? Um, so anytime I navigate around, so let's go into a race. Okay, so now we're in a race. If we look at remote, you can see that they have a 3D viewport and then the entire race tree is under here. In and inside here is dynamic track elements, car rig, and finally the actual camera. So this camera is ultimately gonna be what renders into this viewport. Um, ho hopefully that answers your question about kind of the, the structure to get the low res stuff. Uh, the visual effects in the game, uh, there's a couple main ones. So if we go just look at the game real quick. Hey, Tranquil Marmot. No, I am not using vehicle body. I, I explained in a fair amount of detail today uh, how this car controller works. It's actually different. By the way, that very, very valet video that you're referencing, um, I I made that video. <laughs> That's me. Because uh, I worked on very, very valet. You can see the icon over there. Um, very, very valet was you're controlling a car and the camera is separate. This game, you are controlling the camera and the car is like a puppet. Um, so you steer the camera and the camera applies forces to the car to keep it moving in the direction the camera is facing. And when you drift, we arbitrarily apply a torque to the car to rotate it relative to the viewpoint of the camera to make it look like it's drifting, even though what you're really doing is steering the camera. So we want, uh, so this question came about visual effects. So there's like, um, really there's two major visual effects in the game. There's particles and then there's the tire tracks. So here you can see like there's, right now when I'm drifting, there's smoke coming off the tires and there's sparks behind the car to indicate that you have a boost that you could get. And also the car is leaving tire treads on the ground. So if I if I do a bunch of donuts here and then we stop and I like switch to the debug camera, you can see these tire treads. So I can explain how these two these two things work. Um, the sparks behind the car are just uh, GPU particles. Um, I think if I just look for sparks. Oh, no. Nope. Uh, drift. What did I call them? What did I call them? Boost? Boost FX. Nope, that's the exhaust effect. Oh, that's the third effect. I could show you how this one works too, but this one's this one's kind of simple. Uh, what is it? Uh, drift sparks. Drift. Oops. Drift. But apparently that's not what I called it. Okay, well, here it is anyway. Uh, so this is the the smoke that comes off the car. This is just a GPU particle effect. Um, it has a very simple texture. I don't know if I, there's an easy way to show the texture. That's what the texture looks like. And then I'm using my dither shader. So all the pick particle or the pixels are either on or off. And almost all of it is just tweaking this process material to make this, um, you know, look good as you drive it around, essentially. There we go. That gives you a sense for how it works. Um, and then the sparks. What's the deal with the sparks? Where are the sparks? Don't save this. Oh, they're just they're just in here. Okay. This is what the drift sparks look like. This is also just a GPU particle effect. Um, and this one just has uh, um, essentially a like you see that like little triangle shape. That's the texture, and these are very short-lived particles, 0 0.1 seconds. So you can see if I crank this up, it's that, but really fast. And then I just changed the color of these to give you some communication about the type of uh, 
um, spark you're gonna or the you know type of boost that you're gonna get. The tire treads. Uh, tire track. Okay, so tire track is literally a mesh instance. It's a mesh instance with a script on it. And here's the script. This is another case where I'm using immediate mesh. I don't know if anyone has never heard of immediate mesh. Immediate mesh is awesome. Immediate mesh is a way to say, I'm going to create a mesh from code. Um, uh, so anytime you may have like a weird special thing where it makes more sense to generate a mesh from code rather than to import it from a modeling program or something, you want to use immediate mesh. And so this is actually very simple. Basically, there's a list of points. So as the car is driving around, we, I'm remembering a point every so often. We can draw a picture of it real quick. It's super simple though. It's, it's exactly what you're going to guess. Uh, how it works, but like basically like that. Cars driving around So here, here's our little car, you know, or, and actually it's really it's a single tire So here's the tire on the car, right? Tire is here. Remember this position tire moves a little bit Remember this position tire moves a little bit. Remember this position 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 so every few frames or whatever I just remember where is the tire touching the ground. And then I go in and I generate a mesh that looks like this. Triangle. 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 This just placed slightly above the ground. Triangle. Mer, mer, triangle, mer, mer, triangle. And so what happens is like it's sitting like this and then the car moves forward and we plop down a new point. And so I regenerate the mesh and then this little segment gets added. And then the car, you know, goes over here and we add another segment. So basically, if we need to refresh the mesh, and you can see add point is some other code is saying add point, wait a few frames, add point, wait a few frames, add point, wait a few frames. And then I refresh the mesh by looping over the points, figuring out the direction leading up to this point, the direction leaving this point, turn that into a angle, a normal, and then essentially ultimately add two points to this triangle strip. So I'm not using decals. Um, I think it could be implemented with decals. I have less experience with decals and less experience with Godot and how its decal system works. But decals are generally for projecting a texture. So if you wanted to do this same idea with decals, um, I think what you would do is you'd have these same points and then you would say, okay, find the midpoint between these two and then project a texture like that and then find the midpoint and project a texture like that. I don't know if you, you might have some seams, right? If if the way a decal works is you can project a texture on the onto the geometry, and then I can project another texture onto the geometry. You could have some overlap like this. Um, mine doesn't have that problem because it's a seamless mesh that's connected like this. But yeah. How do you get to the point of seeing the logic you just implemented or the scene change? Oh, sorry. So you were answering someone else's question. Do you ever find GDScript to be lacking? So far, no. So far, I am a big fan of GDScript. I didn't explicitly mention this, but I'm not using C Sharp at all. Even though I'm very experienced in C Sharp, I've made lots of games in Unity over lots of years using C Sharp continuously. Um, but um, when I came over to Godot, let me give you my little rant about this. Um, I was like, I want to try Godot. This project is not too ambitious. I think I can make it in Godot. It's time to learn Godot. Let's do it. And I looked up and it's like, oh, Godot has a GD script, which is their own built-in scripting system. It seems like the the uh, the people who designed Godot thought GD script was the best way to implement scripting and custom logic into Godot games. But then a lot of people requested C Sharp, and so they added C Sharp. And... Um, 
everything I read about it was that like C sharp was kind of like, you know, had to be bolted on later and came with some trade-offs. Uh, and GD script did not have those same trade-offs because it was designed as part of the engine from the beginning. And so me, my attitude towards this stuff is I don't want to show up to the land of Godot as a citizen of C sharp land and say, I've come to visit the land of Godot, but I'm from C sharp land. Tell me how Godot land is like C sharp because I want everything to be what I'm comfortable with, you know? Instead, I want to come visit the land of Godot and say, hello, land from Godot. I'm from C sharp land, but I've heard you do things different here. I'm traveling here for a reason. I want to know how you do things in Godot land. Tell me about this GD script. I'm curious, right? And um, th this is how you should approach switching to new technologies. It's just like traveling, right? If you grew up in one country and you decided to travel to another country, to visit it and see what it's like, you should not expect or view that country through your expectations from your home country. That's the reason you're going to the other country is to see what it's like there, right? So don't be like, where's the Starbucks? If you're used to Starbucks, be like, well, where do you guys get uh, tasty drinks here? You know, and that's the way I view coming over to Godot is like, I didn't want to bring over my my comfort and expectations around C Sharp. I wanted to see how Godot says it would be a fun way to make video games. And Godot says a fun way to make video games would be to use GD script and it's tightly built into the engine. And let me tell you, I'm on board. I love it. I love it. I love the way it's integrated. I love that I never have to wait for C Sharp to like reload a domain or do all of its little calculations that cause a delay between hitting play and playing the game. GD script, you just like change some scripts, hit play, the game runs. It's great. Iteration time is extremely fast in Godot. And I think GD script is part of that reason. So there, I would say that there are a couple things in GD script that, you know, would be cool. I'm making this as a solo game. So this is less of an issue for me. But if I was working on a larger team, I would wish that I could have public and private um, members to my scripts so that I could avoid the problem of someone else using my script and accidentally modifying a member variable that they shouldn't have or calling a sort of private method that they shouldn't be able to. And so the lack of that, I think, could cause some trouble on larger projects where you need to collaborate with a large team. Um, I wish that there was a simple way to do structs or struct-like things. I did run into a slight issue where basically you can kind of fake like you want to have a struct in GD script. If I open up my replay manager. So my replay manager is an example of a thing where I make these little mini classes that are basically just data containers. You know, like, hey, I just I just want this thing called particle snapshot that's guaranteed to have these things. I don't want to use a dictionary. I like using types. So I want to have like these named and typed variables and I want to package them together as a concept. And so you can see I did that a lot here. I have a bunch of these, right? Actually, I sort of like nest it like a snapshot is a array of these things, which has these things in it, you know, etc. That works OK. Um, one thing that I didn't know until later is that anytime you make a little class like this, this uh, silently derives from like Godot engine dot object or whatever. And Godot engine object instances are tracked with like an integer identifier that is a maximum is 24 bits are used to ID it. And so you can't have more than the maximum value of 24 bit unsigned integer instances. And I actually ran into that problem. Someone was playing my game. And if they stayed in a level for more than 12 minutes, the game would crash. And it would crash because I was constantly appending new snapshots for the replay. And each snapshot contained multiple of these little instances of these little micro classes. And every single one of those was being reference tracked by an integer ID and it overflowed past the 24 bit mark. I had too many tiny little mini classes. It'd be kind of nice if you could have like a struct or something in GDScript that didn't have that limitation. But yeah, um, how should I search for work in Godot? I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, Godot's just starting to take off. So I think having some projects you've made and then looking for studios that are using Godot, you know. So actually, that particular issue, Moogle, the way I fixed it is um, 
I I moved a bunch of stuff that I used to be using this to record. And actually, I'm using the Godot's animation system instead now. I create an animation and add a bunch of tracks to it and append keyframes live while the game is running to generate the majority of the replay. So when you're racing the car around, I'm remembering the positions of the car and the tires and every and all the objects you can smash into and stuff and appending keyframes to a Godot animation. And then when the replay turns on, I just replay that animation. I play back the animation that I just created in code. Um, and th by doing that, instead of storing the data myself, I was able to get around that limitation. Hopefully that makes sense. Animation player is amazing. How many objects were there to overflow? I don't know, whatever two to the 24 is. It's a very large number. But it's because I kind of had a I had an extreme use case where I was generating an array that w itself was an array of many objects that were an array of many objects that were all these little tiny subclasses. So my 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 instance count exploded rapidly. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, what else could we talk about? We talked about the gate. We talked about this. We talked about this. We talked about the shaders. We talked about the car physics. Talked about this a little bit. Yeah, custom resources I might just touch on again one more time just because um, uh, if you're kind of newer to Godot like I am, I found custom resources to be really useful. Um, so basically, let me think of a, what's a good example of a custom resource. Ah, my settings screen. Let me show you the settings screen in the game. I'd like to know something about your debug camera. Okay, I can show you that. I'm a new dev and I'm absolutely overwhelmed by learning scripting. Can you give some tips on how to learn how to code? Um, yeah, I mean, I personally think that large multi-purposed engines like Unreal, Unity, and Godot honestly are not the best environment to learn the absolute basics of coding because you're surrounded by all this complex stuff and the code that you're writing, you don't really understand the larger picture in which your code lives. And, and that's, a, that's not a very good place to be learning. I actually personally think you should look at something like Tick80 or Pico8 um, or the, well, really those two, honestly. Uh, if you for the for your very first introduction to coding because those the, there's no big engine your code is like the game is just going to do your code and then loop around and do your code again and that's your entire game there's not some big mechanism outside of it that you don't understand where you have to put these weird keywords that you don't know what they mean and stuff you know what i mean like even a basic godot script like let's look at a simple one like um let's see what's a simple script in this project here's a simple one i have a thing called just spin Okay, this is almost the simplest Godot script you can write. Okay. And it's like, what does extends node 3D mean? What does class name mean? What does export mean? You know, like, and then what's this func underscore process delta float? Like, what even is that? You know what I mean? Like, and well, all that, all that stuff is the Godot context, right? This part is because the way Godot treats everything is everything is a node and nodes are in a tree and the tree controls things like the update order and sequencing of things and every node can, you know, and um, oh, what is this blue arrow? I forget what this blue arrow means. I think it means that this is a Godot method that will get called f like by the engine for you. Like I think if I did func ready, it will also do that. Yeah, it's like telling you that Godot is going to call this method because you named it the right thing. Um, but like, okay, so this is a th this this part is because I guess Godot everything's a node. And then what's this? Well, what's a class? I don't know what a class is. I'm just trying to learn how to write code. Okay, well, whatever. What's func? What's this underscore thing? What's delta? You know what I mean? Like all of this, there's a bunch of stuff here that's like actually the only code going on here is this line. And the rest of it is kind of confusion about the context in which your code will run. Now, if you look at a Pico 8, Tick 80, uh, other people mentioned um, Pi Game, Love 2D. Well, you're not going to see that. You're just going to see a thing that says like main or like draw. And, and like the only context you need to know is that the system is going to call draw every frame. And then everything else is your code. And I think that 
a simpler environment like that is a better place to learn because you can understand the basic like the basic rule which is that um the computer is dumb the computer is dumb and it's just gonna simply do all the things you told it to do in order that's that's it i don't know if i can find like a, i'm trying to find a script that's kind of like somewhere in the middle in terms of complexity I don't know if I've got a good one here off the top of my head. Uh, let's see. Like, these aren't great, but like, you know, like, I don't know, we just look at like this one method here, right? Like, what this is going to do is it's going to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Let's find one with an if. Uh, I have a bunch of for loops in here. Everything's got for loops. I didn't want to talk about for loops yet. But like basic stuff like this, like we're going to do this line, we're going to do this line, and then we might do this line if this condition is true, right? And so like um, in a simpler context, I think it's easier to understand the basics. And then once you get a little more comfortable with coding, then you should you can graduate into more complexity. Any features you're looking forward to in 4.3? Uh, yeah, what was it? I can't remember off the top of my head. I think there's some improved, I would say one of the areas that's a little bit, you know, has, has room for improvement is importing models uh, for 3D games. Um, I should show you this real quick. Um, I should mention that one of the other things I do to achieve this kind of Sega Saturn vibe is if you look at this level, there is some lighting, right? Like, look, it's bright there where the light is and like, you know, like, I don't know, th this, like, uh, area right here by this crease is a little darker, you know, and, like, over here, you can see, like, there's, you know, there's a bright spot on the wall and stuff like that. And that's all coming from baked lighting in, on the vertices. So one of the ways that these older games worked, let's see if I can find a model here real quick. Let's go here models track i guess we're looking at seattle so let's look at seattle so here this is the track in blender it's actually made up of tons of different objects that's so that i can hide and show the objects and simulate the sh short draw distance of the older games um but then you can look here and see this is the lighting and so what i'm doing in blender is I actually set up lights in my scene in blender so where's the light uh, here we go. Like right here. There's a light right here. And then I bake the lighting to the vertices of the models in Blender. So I have a setting here where I go, I want to bake. And I want to bake to the active color attribute, which means the vertex color. So modern games either have real-time lighting or they do light maps, which are textures that store the lighting information. But it's a lot more detail. Uh, older games, all you could do is you could set the color at each point. Like you could set the color here, 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 and here. And so in Blender, I am baking the lighting to these points. And then that gets brought in to Godot if we look at uh, this same. Here's this blend file. And Godot has this like step where you, if you put a Blender file or a GLTF file in your project, you can open up this little window and set a bunch of import settings. This is kind of the clunkiest part of the pipeline of getting art in and out, 3D art in and out of Godot. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can only set in this dialogue here, and it's a little um, limiting in how it works. But one of the things you can do is you can say, bring in the mesh colors. And so I do that, and that brings in the lighting. Um, which I guess we can't see it right here. It's not showing the vertex colors, but basically the, that's how they come in. Why do you consider the approach necessary? Is the game meant to run on very old hardware? No, the game is meant to look like a game from that era. That's just the, that's the stylistic choice I made for how I want my game's art style to look. I want, part of the reason is um, it is a simpler, art style which is good for me because i'm not an incredible 3d artist but i can achieve this low poly older vibe 
And also it means, yes, it's less demanding, so it's going to run on more computers. And um, the concept of this game is a silly concept about rally racing and parking garages, which to me feels like the type of concept that would have happened back in the late 90s. Like if you told me Sega made a game called Parking Garage Rally Circuit that was in the arcades briefly and then got ported to Sega Saturn, I would believe you. <laughs> and that's the vibe this game is going for. So that's, that's it's, 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 it's intentional. It's like some people make pixel art games that try to look like they're on the NES or the Super Nintendo or something. I'm doing the same thing, but with Sega Saturn as my reference. So this game, you know, this game has more polygons than a real Sega Saturn game would have. Um, it runs at a higher frame rate than a Sega Saturn game would. But the vibe of this game is Sega Saturn. So I put a lot of effort into trying to make my game exhibit the visual properties that those older games did. Woo! So yeah. Yeah, so the lighting is there's is like basically free in this game. All all this little shadow and stuff you see here, it's that's just the vertex colors they've been baked in. Um, you'll notice that like the car doesn't get dark when you go into dark areas. You know, the car just stays nice and bright. That's because I don't have any code to care about, or even know what areas are dark as far as the actual game is concerned. Um, that's just coming from the colors in the model. Um, and so my pipeline is I make these levels in Blender, I light, the, I light them in Blender, and then bake that to the vertices, and then I bring those models into Godot. And then I add things like these dynamic props and stuff, like the stuff you can smack into, like the spectator cars, or these railings and stuff like that. You know, those aren't in Blender. Or they're, I mean, they're modeled in Blender, but they're not in this, this scene in Blender. They get added into the scene in Godot. In the trailer in the bottom left, there is headlights. Oh, there's just, there's one track where that's the main gimmick. I could show you that. It's uh, this track. So this track takes place at night. Do you use dithering for everything or is there something that uses blinking? I'm just using dithering. Oh my God, I wasn't looking where I was driving. Uh, the exhaust flames do have dithering when they fade out. So normally the exhaust flames are opaque. I can show you here. When I go around a corner here and I accumulate some boost, let me go around this corner and you can see the flames are bright, 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 faded out. So they, they do dither when they fade out, but most of the time they're opaque. That's just a artistic choice. Um, they have a shader on them that says if the alpha drops, then do the dithering, but the alpha is 1.0 for the majority of their effect. So you can see it right here, like bright, bright, bright. They're going to change colors to orange and to red, and then they're going to fade out right there. Uh, the game is going to come out in November. No, September. The game's going to come out in September. I'm almost done. Um, so I have about a month and a half to fix bugs, polish the tracks here. The, so the lights go out on this track on lap two, and then your headlights turn on. And this, again, is using vertex. All, all the lighting for this dynamic light only applies to the vertices, which is why you get that sort of blocky uh effect that really shows how low poly the environment is and this is very much what these older games looked like when they did dynamic lighting like this but yeah i wanted every track to have some kind of a gimmick and i wanted one track to be take place at night and you have to use your headlights so this track is a little bit special it uses a different shader that knows how to do the headlights that i don't i don't need that shader for the other tracks where the headlights are never turned on that's the main gimmick of this track. Uh, have you had to develop your own Godot plugins extensions to achieve some of the functionality? Uh, let's see. Not really. I mentioned very early in the stream that I made a very simple script called Debug Draw, which is for drawing 3D lines in the scene. So I can debug things. That's an auto load that I've set up. That's an example of something that I could um you know put on the like asset page or whatever if you turned on the headlights 
they, you can't turn on the headlights in the other levels because the objects in those levels do not have the shader that knows about the headlights. <laughs> Eight and 16-bit games use blinking a lot as they were tied to the frame rate. Do you think using blinking is still valid now that frame rates can vary? So my understanding is that um, eight and 16-bit games used blinking to overcome limitations in the hardware. So for example, on the uh, Atari 2600 or the VCS, you could only have on any given line, you could only have three different, you could have the background, two sprites and a single dot for the ball. Um, and so if you wanted to have like, say, like in Pac-Man, if you need Pac-Man plus two ghosts to appear on the same line, you can't draw them all at the same line. So what games would do to overcome that is that they would on frame A draw objects, you know, draw Pac-Man plus ghost A, and then on frame B draw ghost B and flicker back and forth between those so that it looked like all those things were there. Um, so it wasn't really like, uh, flickering was a, it wasn't really related to frame rate. It was that those games generally ran at 60 frames a second or 50 frames a second in PAL. And they were overcoming some scan line limitations of the hardware, basically the max number of sprites you could draw. If you needed more sprites, you had to flicker them and then they would look kind of like they were all there at the same time. <clears throat> Once you get to like PlayStation and Saturn era, the hardware had changed quite a bit and things were less like scan line based. So you don't really see that flicker technique so much anymore. Um, but yeah, is there a plugin for debug draw 3d? Hey, look at this. Yeah, this has got more stuff than mine. Is this all in, uh, in GD script? Oh no, this is in C++. Ooh, nice. Let's check this out later. I made my own simple one. It was good enough for my needs. GD script. Um, the rest of these auto loads are all my stuff. With the exception... Or no, let's go look at plugins. Look, I have one plugin. And this is by Jitspo, who, who did a takeover stream earlier this week. Uh, Jitspo made a dev console. Um, Debug Draw 3D is C-sharp. Oh, I think I looked at it, and that was one of the reasons I didn't incorporate it, because I didn't want any C-sharp in my project. I don't even have the version of Godot with any C-sharp support. Um, yeah, there is multiplayer. I can talk about the multiplayer. Uh, but so this thing, if you press the tilde, you get this little console. And I can do stuff like, say, clear records. And now it's like I'm resetting the game and I don't have any progress. Or I can do unlock all. And now I've got, it's like I've played through the whole game and I've got progress. And I can use all the cars and stuff. And that's using Jitspo's console, which is really cool and very simple. So like right here, you can see it's just like you can add commands to the console that you then can type in and have them do stuff. Basically, if I type this, call this. If I type this, call this. By the way, pass it two methods, which would be strings of stuff you typed after. Uh, so I use Jitspo's uh, console, which is very helpful. Um, and then I'm using Godot, Godot Steam. Steam, Godot, Godot Steam uh, for Steam stuff. And I am using Steam for the multiplayer. I mean, yeah, I have to look at it again, Tranquil. I don't, I don't remember exactly what the deal is. What is a favorite code idea that you carried over from an old project? Hmm. Okay. Springs. Springs. Everyone here is like into Godot, right? And um, I bet you all just love your tweens, don't you? right? You think tweens are so cool and you just use tweens everywhere when you need to animate something dynamic. You want to make like a little pop-up show up or you want to make something fly up to the UI or whatever, right? You're all using tweens, right? Well, guess what? Tweens are limited, okay? The biggest problem with a tween is a tween is uh, tweens are incredible by the way and the fact that they're built into the engine is amazing i guarantee if i search for create tween we're going to find plenty in the game okay here's all my tweens all right i'm not a tween hater i do some tweens okay but there are times in a game where you have something that you want to move smoothly 
but you're going to interrupt it frequently, right? So let me think of, uh, do I have a simple example in the game? Um, let me search for spring. Let's see where I'm using a spring. Here's all the places I'm using springs. Uh, let me see if I can find a good example. Oh, yeah. Okay. Here's a really simple one. Um, uh, let's see. Is this a good one? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Simple example. In my game, let me show you one of the levels. Okay. There's a thing. There's reverb in the game. When you're outdoors, we turn the reverb off. But when you go inside the parking garages, I turn on some reverb. So it's kind of echoey. Sounds pretty cool, right? All the sound effects get, get echoey, right? Um, so how does that work? Well, I have a... Um, I have a... Area 3D, right? So I have an Area 3D with a big old box, right? It's like, hey, anytime you're inside this box, see how big it is? You probably can hardly see that on the stream with the bitrate, but anytime you're inside this box, we should have reverb. When you're outside this box, we shouldn't have reverb, right? So then when you're, when you're coding something like that, you might say, okay, well, I'm just gonna write a script that says when you enter the area, I'll go to the um, audio system. I'll go to the audio system and I'm going to turn this, I'm going to set some value on the reverb, right? Set the reverb to 0.5. And then when you leave the trigger, set the reverb to zero, right? And then you play your game and it works great. But what happens when you enter the trigger, it's this instantaneous change, right? No reverb, no reverb, boom, reverb, you know? And then, and then when you leave, the reverb just instantly goes away. And you're like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. Um, I wanted to like transition, right? And uh, so then you might hook up a tween. So when you enter the trigger, you start a tween that says, take the reverb from zero and slowly, you know, get it up to 0.5 or whatever. And then when you leave the trigger, do the opposite tween from 0.5 down to zero. And th that works fine. But then what happens if you have like multiple reverb zones and you could leave one and a tween starts and the tween's like dig, 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 it starts counting down and then you enter a new one and then you like have to cancel the old tween and start a new tween. And um, in the case of this reverb, reverb example, it probably wouldn't matter because you wouldn't hear a, a pop or something. But um, um there are cases where what you want to be able to do is you have a value you want to move smoothly, but in your code, you want to just be able to set it whenever you want to the new value and just have it kind of react and not instantly change directions, but keep some momentum. And so that is a case for springs. And so I have a spring utility. In fact, uh, over on our Toyful Games like YouTube channel, the other half of Toyful Games, Chad, the two of us comprise the studio, made a whole video about springs and how useful they are for game dev and game feel. And this this script here is an implementation of our spring class that we really like. I don't know if you can hear the dog freaking out right now. Um, but we have a spring class that we use. And I wrote a... You can hear the dog? Okay. <laughs> Someone must be delivering something to the house right now. Someone is walked up to our house carrying something. That's what that sounds like every single day. Um, anyway, so we have this uh, script here that can basically simulate a spring. And um, so a spring is, I use a spring anytime I have a value that I would like to tween, but I'm going to interrupt it all the time and I want it to stay smooth. Um, and so this is an example of something that I've become very comfortable with using and I rely on in lots of games. And when I started using Godot, I was like, I got to bring my springs over, you know. Um, so uh, uh, feel free to look up the game de game feel with springs video or whatever on YouTube and check it out if you want more details on that. But uh, but yeah. So that's something that I brought over. What's something I what was the other half of the question? Something I made new or something like that? Oh, Tranquil Marmot uh, posted the link a, a little while ago to the spring video. Thank you for posting that, by the way. Um. Blah, 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 blah. People are talking about Steam. What kind of programming job do you think 
game dev experience best transfers to. I'm someone who programs something like networking applications and has a different mindset to programming. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've only really truly used code to make games, so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. A lot of UI libraries are using springs lately. That's because they figured it out. Springs are better for tweens if you want to interrupt things. Oh, yeah, the ghost cars. So the ghost cars are super cheap because they are not a simulated car. Um, one way you can do replays in games is you just remember the inputs that someone did, and then you have a live object, and you, you, know, you play back the inputs like it's a controller. Um, um, but that's not how I do it. Um, cause in order to do that, you would need to be physically simulating the ghosts. So here, these ghosts you see, they are just animations. It's just a node that's sliding around with a little bit of code to animate it around. And actually what I do is I, I record these by driving the courses myself. I drive the course. It generates replay data. The replay data has more information than just the car. Like if I smack into this thing, the replay is going to know that that thing fell over. Um, but it also has the car. And so then I have a little function I can use to just pull just the car data out of the replay and save that into a file. And so the game ships with three replays for every track that are the bronze, silver, and gold ghosts. But then also I use the exact same method to upload your ghosts when I'm, when you post to the leaderboard. So the leaderboard also has a ghost for everyone in it. And uh, it's the exact same data as the, what you're seeing here. And it's just an animation. It's just saying like the car was here, then the car was here, then the car was here, then the car was here. And it's lower detail. It's like at like maybe like 12 frames a second or something. Um, but you just interpolate so it looks smooth. But that keeps the file size down. The leaderboard is going to be filled with crazy ghosts from cheating. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. It's kind of hard to avoid that. How do you approach audio for the car engine? Um, actually, yeah, I know there's some new features coming in 4.3. I'm not super familiar with what they are. My audio is pretty simple. If we look at the car rig. Um, let's see. Audio. So I have two looping sounds for the car i have a basic a bass sound that's just like and then i also have like a so basically it's like a low rpm loop and then i have like a like high rpm loop and so when you're not pressing the gas only the low rpm loop plays and when you're pressing the gas i layer in the higher one like that and then they are both pitched based on the speed of the car I think if we look at this, this is the setup. Okay, so right here, so there's the audio. We figure out how fast the car is going and we figure out, we use a curve to figure out the pitch for the bass loop and the acceleration loop. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> it's that time of day. Can't really do much about it. <clears throat> Um, and then, yeah, we're mo mostly just setting the pitch on these two. And then we set the volume based on different things as well. Um, so I can show you the curves for that. So if we look at, uh, I think it's in here. Audio. So over here, you can see here's the loop that this car should use for the base engine. And here's the accelerating one. And then here's the pitch curve based on speed for this one. And then I think, uh, and here's the curve for the base one. And then the, there's no volume curves because they just I just actually didn't end up using that. Um, and then I actually use a spring. See this anywhere you see frequency and damping, it means I'm using a spring. So I'm using a spring to uh, uh, smooth out the volume of these values. Now that's the majority of it. And then um, when you're drifting, then I have sounds for different surfaces. So the car rig has that information. 
you can see over here there's like these surface parameters and there's uh, the default surface which says if you're on layer zero that's from the collision system then does it do your does your turning get affected in any way can you have tire tracks or not are there particles that should be shooting up and then what's the audio so here's the pavement when you're driving normal and here's the pavement sound when you're drifting they're like you know and then if you're on say the dirt um you there's some things that affect your steering you don't release tire tracks you do create some um, dirt particles and then there's different sounds. This is the driving on the dirt sound. This is the drifting on the dirt sound. I got these from, um, like I bought, I purchased these sounds from sound libraries. Went and found a handful of different cars and tire sounds and stuff and purchased them and then edited them a little bit to loop how I wanted and, and, and then implemented them into the game. Does the pitch change when skidding? Actually, there is a pitch curve for drifting where is that used um we do yeah what do we we do i do change the pitch what am i basing it off what's interp interp is based on speed it's based on speed not on angle so if you're if you're drifting and you slow down i think i pitch down the drifting sound and if you're going fast i pitch it up but it's not correlated to the turning actually it might sound cool if it was honestly how much time did you put in this project so far um i've been working on it for about seven months i started it roughly at the beginning of the year it started as a ludum dare um, entry in October of last year. The theme was limited space. So I was like, oh, what's a, what's a limited, what's something that takes a lot of space that would be interesting to try using less space. Racing, racetracks are big. Where's a place you could race that's smaller? Parking garage. Parking garages have lots of ramps and levels to them. So that feels like rally racing. Okay, we're going to rally race in a parking garage. <laughs> that's the, and then I've made that in 72 hours or whatever from Ludum Dare. And then at the beginning of this year, I decided I wanted to make it into a commercial release, and I've been working on it, I would say, half time, like maybe 20 hours a week for seven-ish months. And it's going to come out in September. I'm new to good. How do you make HUDs? Oh, great question. Okay, so let's look at the game UI. Um, I'm searching in the wrong spot. Let's look at the game UI. Okay, so here's the entire game UI. It's got a lot of pieces to it. So, like, here's the pause menu. Let's hide that. Here's the settings menu. Let's hide that. Uh, here's the reset message. Let's hide that. Here's the little fader system. Let's hide that. Here's, like, the replay UI. Let's hide that. Um, here's the results. Let's hide that. Here's the on-screen map. Oh, someone asked about the on-screen map. If anyone's still curious about the on-screen map, like the little like 3D map, I can show you how that works. Um, but here's the main HUD. Right? Here's all the pieces that make up the HUD. And so if we look in the HUD um, and we look at, for example, so most of these are just labels, you know, like if you look at the lap container, it's just a label, two labels, because I have a different font, a di font for the words and then a font for the numbers. Um, and then like over here, the best time or the overall time right here, this is using a special monospace font so that as the numbers change, the like the font doesn't like wiggle. It's one thing to be aware of. If you're going to show a timer, try to use a monospace font because if you use a dynamic font, like the, the number nine is much wider than the number one. And so as the numbers change, like the, you know, the size of the string will move around. And if your eyes can't track the numbers anymore. So this one is like... See, it doesn't move no matter what I change the numbers to because it's monospace. Anywho, um, you were asking about the speedometer. So the speedometer is down here. So if we look at the speedometer, first of all, it's a texture rect for the background piece, which is just this sprite right here. This sprite right here. Okay, so there's nothing special to that. But there's a child object, which is this needle. And you can see that the needle's kind of weird. 
its origin is way down here. And I do that with the offset. Where is that? Pivot offset. See this thing? Now it's at 62. So if I change this number, you'll see the pivot offset move around. And that says, if you rotate this, where does it rotate around? And so I placed it down here, which is, if you look like that's basically the center of the circle, so that I can rotate it and it's gonna move like that, see? So that's just a sprite, it's just a vertical, tiny little sprite. And then in code, I am setting the angle of the sprite. And I can show you the code in a second. I also have a shadow, which is just a second piece, and they're separate so that the shadow is always below. So you can see this one is the same way. And actually, if I, I this will probably work if I grab both these and I, uh, Rotate them, you'll see how it works. You see how the shadow is like always down below it because they're offset a little bit from each other. So that's that's that. There's also a place here to show the number. This is just set in code. Oh, you're going 50? Okay, 50. You're going 52? Whatever, right? And then um, this is just a sprite that shows the units. So if we look at the script for the speedometer, not, this is mostly what there is, is there is what angle should the sprite be at when you're going zero miles an hour? What angle should the sprite be at when you're going to top speed? And then, by the way, what's the max angle that you, you can't go past? In this case, it's pretty simple because it's negative 45, 22.5, 45. But, you know, these are just numbers you would look at your art and decide. And then basically what we do is we say, okay, how fast is the car going compared to its top speed? So this math right here will give you a number between zero and one. Zero if you're at standstill, one if you're at the car's top speed, or technically a number bigger than one if you're exceeding the car's top speed. And then I use that to calculate what the angle of the sprite should be. Zero would be the zero angle, and if you were at 1.0, you'd be at the top speed angle. And then we clamp it to make sure we never go outside of zero or max. And then we ultimately um set this in right here right here and i have a little thing which is that i wanted it to be that if you're going really fast that the the, the meter goes like you know like it's like bouncing off the top and so i have a little bit of extra code here right here where we like look up a, a, in a curve and have a little offset and the amplitude of that is based on how fast you're going and stuff. But th that's like a little bit of extra sauce to make it look cool. But that's basically that's basically it. I don't know if, if that answered your question around how stuff like that works. I'm curious about the audio stuff. Did you make anything dynamic with the music? No. Um, what I do with the music is I have a... Uh, I have a little music manager, which is an auto load. When it gets created, it sets up two audio stream players. And then whenever someone says like, play some music, please. It picks one of the players and starts playing the music. And then if you say, play some, play, play some different music, it starts playing the music on the other one and then fades out the other one. So you get like a little crossfade between the music tracks. So basically you can see like anytime we want to start a song, this start song now gets called and we figure out, okay, if currently the active player is zero, then we want to use active player one. Otherwise use active player zero. So we figure out which player we want to set up and set the new stream to and call play on. And then we fade out the old one. And the fade out basically just makes a tween and fades out the volume on the old one and then stops that one when it's done. So it's like a little crossfade system. And then basically what I do is... Um, there's music in the menus that crossfades when you go to different places. When you start a, tr a race, I stop the music. So you just hear the three, two, one, go. And then right after the go, I start the song for that track. And then it pl plays that song. And then when the race ends, I play like a little race ending sound. And then after that, I go back to the menu music. So it, there's some sequencing and stuff to the music, but I don't. there's nothing dynamic about the music. Yeah. 
Um, okay, let's see. Are there some questions that I missed? Dun, 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 dun. Uh, let's see. We talked a little bit about... Oh, the minimap. Minimap. Let's talk about the minimap. Let me show you the minimap. In the game. It's very simple, but let me, sh let me show you how it works. So if we go into any of the tracks in the game, let's do a simple one like this one, maybe. So you can see in the lower right, there is a minimap. And as I drive around, the little like red arrow that represents my car kind of updates, but also like the minimap rotates to, to sort of match the direction I'm looking. So the arrow is always pointing up essentially. Um, and it is a 3D map, so you can see, like, areas that are elevated, you know, appear differently. Also, there's, like, a fade to it. So the track is opaque where I am right now. Um, but the other areas of the track far ahead or far behind me are sort of dithered out. And it's kind of filling in as I drive around. This is because if the whole track was filled in, the tracks cross over each other a lot in 3D. Because, in fact, let me show you a different, a more 3D track, like... Yeah, like like this. So here you'll see like like as the track turns a little bit, you'll see like you know, like right now I'm like under a spot and then we're going to come up here and we're going to drive over that same spot again. And so that was kind of crazy to figure out like how would you even you can't just do like a Mario Kart kind of like top-down view because the tracks are so 3D, they cross over each other a lot. And, the, and you know, you're on the second floor and then you're on the third floor and you're right above where you were a second ago. And also I felt like these older 3D games really were, really loved the fact that they were 3D. And so they would take every opportunity to like make things in 3D, including the mini map. So those two elements kind of combined. Um, so anyway, that's what it looks like. Uh, how does it work? As you might imagine, um, it is, sorry. It is, first of all, if we look at the game UI, and we hide all this stuff again, there's a spot for the map over here. And this has a viewport. So we're going to render a camera, a 3D camera, and then show the contents of that 3D camera into this region of the screen. And then we have the player indicator which, which will be, get placed around. Oops. Here. This will get placed wherever the player is. Um, and then the actual like content of the map will be displayed in this viewport right here. The red triangle is a sprite. That's correct. Um, and it, actually, the red triangle never needs to rotate because it's we're going to rotate the camera so that the map is always oriented like a jigsaw almost where it's always the way you're facing in game is always up in this little mini map. So if we go look at one of the tracks, uh, actually I can show you this. So here's this track as a track, right? But I also have a second blender file. So this is track 02 Seattle. Here is the map. So this is the same this is to scale. This is the same size as the track, just a mesh that's been extruded along the path you will actually drive. See that? So this is the path you will actually drive and it's exactly one-to-one. -one. It's the same size. And so if we go look in the scene here, here's our track. And then over here is a copy of the mini map. And it's set up so that basically what I can do is the uh, in, in this piece over here is placed inside the on-screen map right here. So you can see it's a child of this viewport that's going to be drawn in the corner of the screen. And there's a camera here that's going to be the thing that's actually looking at the map. And the map itself is just sitting there. And then the, the map is set, placed over here, 
And then what we can do is we can take the position of the car in world space and say that's relative to the origin of the map. And so then we can calculate essentially where is the car on this map by just taking the position of the car and then sliding it over to line up with the map. Did you make the child of sub viewport? How do you make the child of the sub viewport visible in the editor? Oh yeah, so game UI is a scene and if you right click and say editable children, then you can like mess with the scene that the the instance of the scene that's nested into this larger scene and i have to do that it's not a great way to do it there's probably a better way to do it this is a little bit me i built this scene when i was really early in the project so i think there's a way to do it now where i could do it with viewport textures or something um and i could have this live somewhere else in the hierarchy but the way i have it right now is every track i make i import the game ui and then i mark it editable and then i embed the map into the hierarchy so then there's a screen, there's a script here for the map. And you can see that like basically we say, okay, give me the race script. Give me the car. Okay, if there is a car, then what's its global position? And then also we can ask it like, where are they uh, around the track? And I can show you that that's how we do the filling in with the colors. Oh, no, I meant that by default, children of viewport are invisible in the primary. Oh, uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it might be because the root of this scene is a node 3D and it's not like a... There is no viewport higher up the hierarchy. Because my whole project is that these scenes get embedded into a viewport that's in a, that's in a main scene, I think is the reason. But I don't know for sure. Um... And so basically, yeah, and then we rotate the camera to match the direction the car, the, the, the player is facing. There's always a viewport in the scene tree. I don't think so. I mean, I don't explicitly have one. You mean there's like, there's like a hidden viewport above, above this? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I have seen that happen though before where it's like you, you have to like, you know, like navigate into the sub tree to see it. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how that's working, honestly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so basically this camera just rotates like this, based on which way you're facing. And then the map itself has a shader on it. Um has a shader on it, which I guess is just sitting in here. But it meant, essentially there is a value called player lap interp that you can move. I guess I can't do it here. Let me see, is there an easier way I could show this? The way I make these maps is the UVs are, um, like, where's the start of this track? The start of this track is right here. So you can see, all right, it's right here. So basically, as you walk along the UVs here, the UVs are moving to the right. And the, the size of them represents the distance of each little piece here. And so I set up the UVs like that, so that the whole track is mapped to the X axis. So then what I can do is if I know you're 50% around the track, in the shader, I can say, I can compare the UV position of each vert to where the car is and decide if I should draw this piece opaque or draw this piece dithered out. And that's how I get it to fill in as you're driving around. So as you're driving around, I'm detecting where you are on the track and turning that into a number between zero and one. And I pass that number into the shader to fill it in. And so you can see right here, like it thinks right now that the player is somewhere around right here. And then as the player moves around, it's gonna it's gonna change that number. And then that's gonna fill in the thing. I think I could do this real quick. If I go like this, if I say, let, give me, let's do a surface material override with a new shader. The shader is the map, the map, there we go. Then I should be able to, yeah, there we go. 
Uh, I don't have these values set the same as the real one, but you see how this like the, the thing is moving around. So if I set this to zero, it's like that's the beginning of the track right there. And then if I set it to one, it's going to be right back where it's at. But if I set it to 0 0.9, it's back here. And if I animate it around, you can see it looping around. So that's all done in this shader. I also use the, almost the exact same shader on the uh, track select screen. Um, so the track select screen uses that same map mesh. So right here. This is that same map mesh that's used for the minimap in game, but now it's just sitting here and I'm using a path follower because there's no car and the path follower is moving along the path. And then I use the value of the path follower to pass to the shader to animate the cool little red like gradient that's like sliding around the track. And so that's how you get these little previews of each track. And you can see I made a shadow here where I just made a copy of that mesh and squished it and put the dither shader on it to get the... So you can get some sense of the height and kind of how complex each track is, how big each track is, because these are to scale. So like this track compared to this track compared to this track. And so you can kind of see... Get it. That all works out pretty cool. And I think this is kind of similar to how those older games would, uh, would approach it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm -hmm -hmm. Um, let's see. Any other questions? I can show you anything in the project. I, I had a few other things here I could talk about. Could talk about a little bit more about uh, localization. The game supports a bunch of languages. Could talk about input remapping and how I do the button prompts and stuff. Could talk more about the replay system. We talked about the mini map. We talked about custom resources. Um, yeah, so the replay system. So as far as I know, the first thing I should say, oh, no, I'm not using Steam input comedy. I am just using straight up Godot's, you know, input map. And I do have a, some scripts. Like in the game, you can remap the controls and stuff. Uh, so I can show that real quick. Options, controls. And, it, you know, if I go here, I can be like, oh, I want that to be the T key or I want that to be the O key or, you know, tab or whatever. Um, and then you can, like, reset it to the defaults. And it works with the controller as well. So I can just be like, oh, left stick. That makes no sense for accelerating. But whatever, maybe we could say use the up on the D-pad or whatever. So I, I wrote some code to do that remapping, but all it's really doing is talking to the Godot input map system and saying, hey, take away the old mapping. Here's a new mapping or whatever. It's, it's quite simple. Um, and I use the basic stuff to save that. I also have dead zone settings here exposed and also sensitivity settings for people that want to use weird controllers or steering wheels. Um, okay, so yeah, so replays... Or I guess I should just mention briefly how the multiplayer works. I'm using Steam Godot, and I'm using Steam for all the multiplayer. I'm not using any multiplayer nodes at all. Um, it's kind of disgusting, uh, but there's a somewhat good reason for it. So if I look at multiplayer, well, yeah. Um, Basically, I send messages using Steam's message system. This has been tested for multiple. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing I've been doing playtests constantly over the last six months for this game, and multiplayer has been part of those playtests for the last maybe three months or so. And um, players players play and use it regularly. It definitely works. There are some bugs. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, it works. It's non-contact multiplayer, so it's very simple, and it's peer to peer, no server. So basically I'm using Steam's uh, stuff like here. If I want to send a message, I use this thing and we call Steam send message and we send some data um, and we receive messages by using Steam's read read messages stuff. I forget where that is, where exactly that is. I think it's right here. Read messages on the different channels and we and I just like send data over. I send data either on a handshake channel or race event channel, which just uses dictionaries and like JSON basically, 
or the player data channel, which is like binary. And this really tried to, tries to optimize. No, there won't be another demo because the game's going to release in September. So I'm just focused on getting the game done for the release. Uh, but I can show you real quick. So basically what I do is I already have a replay system. The replay system can show a ghost of a car and animate it around the track, right? So my multiplayer simply creates a live ghost that instead of having a replay from on disc with all the keyframes, the keyframes are just coming over the network. But the as far as the game is concerned, it's just a ghost, a ghost that has keyframes that it's animating. Those keyframes are coming from some code that inserts the keyframes live, but the playback of the other players is using the replay system and the ghost system. So most of the game doesn't know if it's showing a ghost that came from the disc that's baked into the game or a ghost that was downloaded from the leaderboards or a ghost that's a live multiplayer player. So that's one of the reasons I didn't use any of the high level networking nodes and stuff is because I wanted to just send data and inject keyframes into my ghost system. So if I show that part real quick, if I look at a race, this is the most disgusting script in the game, by the way, this one, this one's 1300 lines. But if we look at like a send car data, so here's what here's how I send the car data. I make a packed byte array that I know is going to be 31 bytes. And then I say, okay, step one, um, put in the little note that says this is car data. Encode the timestamp as a integer, by the way. And then append the car's position, the car's rotation, and the car body's rotational offset. In, pack in the steering data. Magic numbers. Well, this is... Uh, I have a little spreadsheet where I keep track of how I am uh, compressing the car data. So, you know, it's fine. If I change anything in here, I have to change this line too. But it's it's fine. It's perfectly fine. So basically, we, we toss in um, the position and rotation of the car, the steering information, um, it, what, what's going on with the lights, so that like the brake lights and the t reverse lights light up and stuff. And then for each car tire, we encode the shock like how far down is the tire from the body um and where are we on the track and then we send that over the wire basically and then there's like a thing that does the opposite there's like decode car snapshot that basically does the opposite where it says okay let's read all the data and turn it into a snapshot data that my ghost manager can handle and since the cars don't contact with each other, it's just, it's just good enough that everyone is sending their information to everyone else and they're generally showing up where they are roughly for everyone else using P2P. So it's not hardcore competitive, but it's like, it works and it's fun. Um, suspension is basically just springs, like forces based on springs if you look at uh I, I if you watch the vod you can go back and i go over this in more detail earlier in the stream but um if we look at car tire oops that's the wrong one rally car tire here uh basically you have a spring that has a strength and a damping and you do you do math like this which ultimately results in Essentially, uh, where is it? A spring force minus spring damping. And the spring force is the offset of the spring times the strength. And the damping is the velocity of the spring times the damping. And you take those and subtract them from each other. And that gives you a force that you apply to hold the car up. Does Steam handle cheating concerns? No. Cheating will absolutely be a concern all day long. <laughs> Um, someone could modify this game and make their car slightly faster. And there's not much I could do with peer to peer to catch that. If I wanted to have a truly competitive online multiplayer game, it would probably require a server and the simulation happens on the server, uh, so that players cannot, you know, disrupt the data. Um, so we'll see if it becomes a problem. If the game is popular, I'm sure it will be somewhat of a problem, but you can always just do friends only matches and stuff like that if you want to avoid 
uh, public lobbies with cheaters and stuff like that. Um, interested in localization? Yeah, localization in Godot is amazing. Godot has basically glorious built-in localization, so I haven't had to do very much for localization. Um, what you do is, if you import... There's a couple different ways you can do localization. I'm doing the simple way, which is using CSV files. Um, Godot has a nice way to create servers for multiplayer game. There are even some companies that offer hosting. Yeah, yeah. I think if someday if I do a more competitive game, I might, I might go down that route. And you can export a version of your game that doesn't render any graphics, like a headless version, which is the version of the game that would run on the server to just do the simulation, but none of the rendering, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a multiplayer expert at all, though. That's why I went with peer-to-peer, -peer, no contact for this game. This is going to be my first game that I've shipped as a solo um, that has multiplayer at all. So I'm, you know, I'm getting there one step at a time. Um, and yeah, there are leaderboards in the game. Leaderboards are kind of the main, like, the main competitive and social aspect of the game is leaderboards. And leaderboards have ghosts. Actually, let me show this real quick, just because it's kind of fun. So if we go here and we look at one of the tracks, we can load the leaderboard and see that my playtest has... 90 people that have done this track, right? And currently I am 39th, right? Um, but if we want, we can just, we can uh, select the top place person and say challenge. It's gonna download their ghost. And now we can race the top player. Um, and there they go. And uh, we're probably not gonna see much of them because I'm significantly behind them on the leaderboard. But there's the top player, and I can sort of race against them and try and figure out what the heck are they doing, right? I can also race more than that. So we could go here and say, let's race, let's look at the top five players. And now it's going to download all five ghosts, and we're going to race all five at once. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So here's what the top five players look like. Let's see how long I can keep up with them. Right. They've already out drifted me, out boosted me by the first lap. I'm already like five seconds behind, probably. No, maybe not five seconds, a couple seconds behind. No! Well, now I'm way behind. <laughs> and yes, you can select all. So we can go to the leaderboard and we can say, I want to race everyone. This might take a second because it's going to download 90 ghosts. Um, but this will show you that the ghosts are not simulations. You, I couldn't possibly have 90 rigid bodies all going, running the full simulation and collision and everything all at once. This is just going to be 90 playbacks of, you know, what the what those players did. We'll see if it works. I'll just keep talking while it's slowly downloading. <laughs> so the right now, the leaderboard page um, maxes out at showing 200 entries. So... I guess you could click all and wait for it to download 200. Uh, this data is stored in Steam. So Steam has a way to upload UGC that's associated with games using Steam Workshop. So I am uploading the little tiny files of everyone's recordings. When I post to the leaderboard, I also upload to Steam Workshop. And Steam Workshop has a mode where you can make like invisible files that don't show up in like the... If you go to browse the workshop for this game, you won't see all these ghosts but they're there because they're game managed workshop files so i upload them to steam get the id upload to the leaderboard and then associate the id with the leaderboard is there a way to cancel actually i don't know if there's a way to cancel right now i think if i hit back right now we can leave the screen and it'll stop <laughs> um i don't want to press it right now though because i'm committed to trying to race 90 ghosts but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can back out of the screen Let's see what 90 cars looks like while I'm streaming. We're at 80. 10 more cars to go. We're going to race all these people. Yeah, like I said, it will only display 200 ghosts, so that would be the max. Okay, frame rate's struggling a little bit. 
Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> it's a sea of cars that I'm racing against right now. Yeah, you can see the... the... Frame rate's struggling a little bit. Now I'm into the back section of the pack here. <laughs> so then if we go to replay. This is what this is what a hundred ghosts look like. Ninety ghosts, I guess, technically. <laughs> Does a ghost hold the same amount of space or data as the player? No, the ghosts are simplified. It's it's keyframes at like uh twelve frames a second or twenty frames a second or something like that. Yeah, we can see how does everyone take this corner? Look at this person. They really took this corner wide. Bonk. And then the, the back tires just went up over the barrier. <laughs> but yeah, so kind of cool. And I should probably profile this to figure out what's the main bottleneck. I have a feeling it's searching for the keyframes, um, but I'm not 100% sure. The data comes from the client. That's correct. Yes, yeah, so... If a cheater cheats, like, you'd be able to see their... You'd be able to see, like, what it uploaded, you know? Like, maybe their car's just abnormally fast, or they, like, had had a teleport glitch or something where they just, like, cheat and go through the checkpoints or something. It would probably show up in this data unless they also put an effort to, like, fake the replay data. But, yeah, anyway, so that's the... That's that. Um... And yeah, so pl playing back replays from the ghosts and also um, in multiplayer are just using the same system, this ghost system. So you can see like um, basically the replay system is just recording what's happening in the game, basically. Um, so if we go down here to like uh, process, whoops. So process recording, which happens in um, fixed update or whatever, uh, physics process, um, captures a snapshot, and the snapshot captures all the transforms it needs to record, all the cars it needs to record, the car rigs, the tire tracks, the particles, the animation players, and the sounds. And so each of these are kind of recorded in slightly different ways. Um, like tire tracks, I have a whole system where I loop through all the tire tracks and I make a snapshot that says, give me the all your points. So it actually, you know, when it plays back, it actually like lays down the tire tracks and you can rewind it and stuff because we, we go back to those objects and give them new points during the playback, for example. Particles are kind of similar, but you can see particles use the animation system. So I use a lookup to say, this particle, tell me which animation tracks are associated with it and then we insert keyframes about whether it's emitting or not what color it is and what the emission amount is um same thing with animation players uh sounds we also have to a track to just keep track of the the volume and the pitch of a sound that's been playing so that would be like the engine sound the drifting sound stuff like that um and then when we play back we play the animation player and then we also do some other interpolation of stuff that's not stored in the animation player. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but essentially there's like three different ways you could do replays in games. One way is to just record the screen, right? Like a video. While the player is playing, record the screen. If you have like a Nintendo Switch or something, right? It's always recording like the last 30 seconds of your screen. And so you can, after something cool happens, you can press a button and save a video, right? You could do that in your game too. You could write some code that captures a screenshot and stores them 
And then the downside to that would be that when you want to play it back, you're limited to what happened on screen. You couldn't go look at it from a different angle or something, right? Because it's literally a video. And yeah, it would be very, it would use a lot of memory because you're basically recording a video while the player is playing. That would be one method. Another method is to replay inputs. So you just record that the player pressed, you know, left, down, press jump, they held right for a long time, then they press jump, then they let go of right or whatever. You just record a little piece of data that says, at each time, what were they doing with the inputs? And then in order to play back the game, you reload your scene and let the game play live. But instead of looking at the controller to tell the character what to do, you look at your recording. And then if everything is deterministic, the same things will happen, right? The, the character will run and jump and end up at the same place. Um, there's a real difficult requirement to do things, things that way, which is that your entire system needs to be deterministic, right? If on if on um, if you have some randomness in your game, you got to recreate the randomness exactly so that everything stays in sync. Uh, but yeah, Trackmania and other games do that, where they will um, just store the inputs. That's really cheap. It doesn't use very much memory. It's very simple to play back because you're just using your existing game. You just you just like essentially unplug the controller and plug in a, some data that says press left, press right. And the rest of the game is dumb and doesn't know if it's being played by a player or being played by a replay. Uh, but the downside is everything has to be deterministic, which means your game has to produce the same result perfectly from the same inputs, which means you better do everything in fixed step uh, because, and you better not have any randomness. Or if you have randomness, you have to use a seed so that everything stays exactly the same. Like imagine in Minecraft, right? If you break a brick and you and you dig down and then you find gold. Why is that gold always there? It's because the seed for the world is the same seed, right? So if you put in the same seed again, it'll generate the same world and the gold will end up in the same spot, right? You have to do something like that for your game so that anything that's randomized in your game is repeatable. Um, it's actually very difficult to write a game in such a way that the inputs are 100% deterministic. Um, but it has the benefit that you can just store the, re the inputs then and replay it back. It's also really helpful for bugs. If you're playing the game and you and a bug happens and you have a debug command to like save your replay data, you could save the replay data and then you could load up the game again and play the replay back and try to reproduce the bug, which is quite cool. Um, the downside is that when you want to play back a replay, you have to the game has to be playing live. So what if you wanted to jump forward 10 seconds into the replay? You can't do that. The only way to get the game in the state that is the state of the game 10 seconds from now is to simulate all the steps in between. Maybe you could try to fast forward a little bit and simulate time faster than real time. But what if you wanted to rewind 10 seconds? You, you can't do that, right? Because you've already forgotten the state from 10 seconds ago. So you have to go back to the beginning and re-simulate. So, you may have seen in my replay system, I can pause time, rewind, fast forward, skip. And that's because my replay is essentially an animation. It is not inputs. So that means it's kind of hybrid. It uses more memory than inputs, less memory than a video. Uh, but you can seek in time for free. And uh, you could play back lots of them on top of each other because the CPU cost is low. You're not actually simulating anything. You're just sliding around transforms or nodes or whatever. Uh, that's why I can race 90 ghosts, right? Because we're not simulating 90 cars. We're just sliding 90 objects around with some data. Um, so those are the different ways you can do it. Uh, Godot's animation system is actually really powerful. So you can literally make an animation player, create an animation in code, create animation tracks in code, and then as the game is happening, just add keyframes. And then later in your code, you can hit play on that animation player and play back what happened. Pretty awesome. Actually, you can see that here if we say um, we'll add, is it insert keyframe or something like that? Yeah, so like uh, all the transforms are actually just talking to the animation player. And we just say, hey, here's a, there's a position track with this ID. Insert a keyframe for this time with the current position of this node. Here, there's a rotation track at this ID. At this time, insert this value. Uh, yeah, and I think it's 
The physics run at 60 frames a second, and I am capturing the physics every four physics steps. So half of 60 is 30, half of that is 15. So I guess I'm recording the replays at 15 frames per second. So every four physics steps, I do a snapshot. Four physics steps, snapshot. Four physics steps, snapshot. Um, and then um, I can save that data to disk or load it again later, and that's how you get the ghosts. Oh, physics step. So this is a really important concept for... Um, let me do my little diagram I always do when anyone asks about physics steps. Okay. So basically... I like drawing this diagram, so don't don't mind me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 12 is a reasonable guess. So basically, you know, time is going while your game is running, right? But your game is like a modern game on a modern computer. How frequently is the game actually updating? Let's say you're running on a, um, you know, like 120 hertz monitor. So basically, like 120 times a second, you're, the game will draw the screen. Except not, right? Because what happens is your game's running along great, and then you walk into that one spot in your game where you have too much stuff, and this frame takes longer. And then it's back to 120, and then it slows down again. There's a couple of really long frames, and then it's like back to 120 or whatever, right? So often a game looks like this. Okay? So... So this is the visual frames that the player sees, right? And it's like, boom, 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 boom. We missed a refresh. We missed a refresh. Then we saw it. We saw it. We saw it. We missed a refresh, whatever, right? So essentially, the frame rate is kind of variable. If you did a great job optimizing your game, then maybe it, it, it's perfectly like that. But also... Stuff could happen that's not your fault. Like, you know, someone's also downloading some junk in the background. They're streaming to Twitch or whatever. And this delay, this delay could be caused by something other than your game. Okay. So um, that's not a big deal. Uh, but physics engines in particular really don't like that a little bit of time happened and then a lot of time happened and then a little bit of time happened. The physics can become less stable if, if they... If like they, you try to pretend like you're like, hey, physics update, please. An hour just passed. Okay, just kidding. Only a second passed or whatever, right? And so physics engines would really like to update at a very constant rate, some well-known constant rate. They're just like, boom, we just move in these perfect update, 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 update. And all these are the exact same size, okay? So what modern game engines like Godot will do is they have two separate concepts. They have process. I'm going to write this giant. They have process. And then they have physics. <laughs> physics underscore process. Okay. And so what that means is that for each node, uh, Godot, every time there's a new frame, Godot will talk to your node and it will call the process method. It'll call it here. It'll call it here. It'll call it here. And not only will it call it here, but it will tell you how much time has elapsed since the last one. So here, this might be like, you know, one over 60 or whatever. And then, and then they call it again with one over 60 because only a 60. But, but this one, there was a delay. And so they call it with one over 20 or whatever, right? So that is... Um, if we look at uh, process. So this function gets called for every visual frame. And this value tells you how many seconds have elapsed since the last frame. That number will vary. You know, it might be stable most of the time, but sometimes it won't be because there was a hiccup or there was a shader cache or your computer decided to like, you know, uh, connect to a USB device or whatever. Um, then there's physics process and Godot says, I will try to call physics process at a reliable frequency, unrelated to the visuals. Uh, you can control how often that happens in the project settings under physics. 
you go to physics, common, physics ticks per second, this number. So the way I have mine set to 60, which means 60 times a second, Godot will call physics step and will update the physics engine, which means sometimes, like if you look here, two frames, like this frame could happen and then a physics step happened, but then this frame happened and no physics step happened because it was too soon. So all that happened was a process. And then the next frame, enough time has passed so you get a process and a physics process. And then the same thing, we skip one and all we get is process. And then the next frame, enough time has passed so you get a process and a physics process. And then the next frame, it like caught up again, so I got two, etc. And so what that means is that it means that process is guaranteed to happen every visual frame, but the time between them is not guaranteed. It could vary. Physics process is guaranteed to be called at a fixed real time rate, but you might have a frame where this is not called and you might have a frame where this is called more than once to catch up. That would be this case right here where like we called it and then no new frame has happened, but we got a new physics update and then finally a new frame happens and like we get a physics update or whatever. Okay, so that is like a fundamental thing to understand. And if you're doing stuff that's talking to the physics system, it makes sense to do it inside physics process because that's the frequency with which the physics are being updated. But if you're doing stuff that's just visual and just needs to update every time a new frame is presented to the player, you want to do it in process. Hopefully that was a good explanation. Not to jump ahead, but matching the visuals to the physics has been a pain point. Yes. So 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 this can cause a problem because my my car is a rigid body. Rigid body only updates when there is a physics step. And so what can happen is like, um, let's do like a zoomed in view real quick. So a lot of games, you will see some kind of like stutter. Um, and that usually happens because of a discrepancy between the frame rate and the physics update. So let's, let's do a simple example. Let's say that like we're running the game on a 100 Hertz monitor. I bought some weird monitor and it updates at a hundred times per second. And it's very reliable. I got a good computer. It's happening a hundred times a second, right? So here's my, here's my little frames. And then I have my physics set to update 60 times per second. That's not an even multiple. So the physics are going to be like, the boxes are a little bit bigger, right? It's going to be like this. This is, I don't know, this is probably not quite to scale, but like you get the idea. And then maybe they line up every so often or whatever, right? And so then what happens is my car there will be two frames, like let's say the car is here, right? We're gonna see a frame where the car is here. Next frame, the car hasn't moved because the physics engine hasn't updated yet. And so we'll see two frames where the car was here. And then on the next frame, the physics will have updated and so the car will jump to here. But then look, on the next frame, the physics updated again, and so the car will jump to here. So we had two frames where the car was here, and then car moved, car moved. We had we had one here, so car moved. We have one here where they line up again, car moved. We have one here where they didn't line up again, car's here again. And so what this would look like is you have two frames of no of the car not moving, and then moving, 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 doesn't move, 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 doesn't move, 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 doesn't move. Now imagine that you've, de you've designed your camera as a separate object and the camera has a script that runs in process. And every frame, it tries to move towards the car, right? So here, so let's say uh, we, like on this frame, the camera was like, you know, was like here. And then what happens is the car camera hasn't moved, but the camera got a chance. So the camera will move a little closer, right? But then the next frame, the car is here now. So now the camera is going to lurch and go here and then 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 here. And so what you get is the camera's like moves, moves like slow, then moves fast, 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 slow, fast, 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 slow, because sometimes it gets two frames to catch the non-moving car. What that will look like on screen is that the car is like going like this. 
because it's normally good, but then the camera catches up and then the camera loses it and then the camera catches up and then loses it and you get this like jitter. And the faster you go, the, the more the car's moving per frame, the more that's gonna show up. And so essentially, if you code things in a very simple way where you don't actually know about this, you're gonna get weird stutter. And one way to fix it would be to move your camera to do be in physics process. But then what happens is what if someone is playing your game on a really fast computer, like this fast? This person is running your game at like 300 frames per second, but they're not going to see smooth 300 frames per second motion. They're going to see 60 sec frames per second motion because the actual physics are only updating at 60 frames a second. Um, so this is an annoying problem. Um, and yeah, there's a thing called physics interpolation, which tries to fix this. And the way it fixes it is what it does is it waits until, so like, uh, let, let, let's say we, we are currently on this frame right here. What the system will do is it will say, well, look, I remember that as the most recent physics update, the car was, you know, uh, the car was here and a f and one physics update in the past the car was here and now uh, for this current frame we are about 60 percent of the way through the next physics update so i'm gonna go into the past and i will place the car right here and then like the next frame comes around right right here and it says, well, for this frame, I'm at like 30% of the way. And so I'm gonna take, and we now have this this one. So now we're going from this one to this one and we're only gonna go 30% and we'll put the car here. And so what the player sees is the car goes from here to here to these like weird interpolated positions, but you get a new position every frame at the expense of a delay where you're always looking a little bit into the past because you only have uh, good data from the past to, that you could slide smoothly between. So you always have to be one fix update behind. So if you do, if you turn on that, your phys and you have like a really twitchy game or something, then your physics won't feel quite as responsive because you're always like one one fixed up in the past. Um, I am doing that. That's what I'm doing. Um, and I think this is this was in Godot three. Like you could check a checkbox and like turn on the interpolation. Um, and I'm in Godot 4.2 and that checkbox went away in Godot 4 and I think is getting resurrected in 4.3. But, um, I have, uh, I just implemented it myself. So if you look at the car rig, the car rig, oh, whoops, we already have it here. The car rig is a, is a, not the car rig, sorry, the rally car. Uh, let's look at like this one. So the rally car is a rigid body, but then I have this child called interpolation root. So when the car moves, we we interpolate it. Oh, I went. Um, the opposite works just fine. So on a slow computer, it's fine. Because what happens is then like, uh, on a slow computer, it's like this. And so what happens is even though you only on the next frame, three physics updates have happened and you can still do the interpolation thing and it's fine even if these these lines don't line up uh that's something to be aware of though uh you can have like a what's like called like a death spiral which is um which is basically like imagine you have a computer running really slow like it's like oh it took a long time and the game was like dang i need to do five physics updates that's how much time has passed, you know? If this is uh if this is one sixtieth of a second, it's like dang, five of those have passed. I gotta do five physics updates. But maybe five physics updates take longer to calculate than this amount of time. And so then the next frame is even longer. It's like and then it's like, oh no, now I need to do six. And then it gets even even longer, and then it's like I need to do seven. And the game can actually spiral and the performance completely dies. Uh, there's a protection against that, which is this max physics steps per frame is eight. So you can set a max to be like, look, if the game can't keep up and even though enough time has passed that we should be doing 30 physics updates, don't do it. 
just do eight. So you can basically have like a bottom out where it doesn't get any worse. Uh, but yeah, that's something to be aware of. That's what this is. I just realized I don't need enable object picking. I should probably turn that off. I bet I would get some performance from that. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so in my car, I do I do some interpolation right here. I have this simple script that's like, I'm an interpolated rigid body. I assume my parent is a rigid body. I remember where I am as of the latest physics update and where I was one before that, which happens right here. And then in process, I lerp between them based on this thing built into the engine called get physics interpolation fraction. Yes, and everything visual on the car is under here, but not the collider, for example. You know, the collider is just attached here and then the raycast origins are here, but all the visuals are inside this. So actually like the Bridget body is moving around, but the visual car is like sliding a little bit to be smooth. Yeah, I can't remember. I remember I was working on this and I was trying to do it myself. And then I found this and was like, because <gasps> calculating this value is actually really hard to do. Oh, the debug camera. There's not much to the debug camera in the game. Basically, I have a little free cam script. I use the free cam script in the, um, like in the replays and stuff when you want to be able to fly around. And so... I just have a hotkey where if I'm playing the game in the editor, if I hit a hotkey, I just turn on the free cam so that you can fly around and like stop driving the car. Um, I think it's just in the scene. Let me see. Is it just in here somewhere, the free cam? Yeah, free cam right here. Does it freeze the game logic? You could or you could. You don't have to. Either way. Um, I'm new to Godot. Mainly come from Unreal. And I'm super impressed by the community. Yeah, me too. I mean, everyone um, everyone that I've met um, either here on Twitch. There's a lot of streamers who stream, you know, game dev um, in Godot. And they're all super nice and friendly and helpful. And everyone I've interacted with in the Discord and stuff is, uh, is super nice. By the way, that's one thing. If you don't know about this in Godot... One thing that's really cool is this thing called process mode. This basically, for each node, you can say, should it always update even when the scene tree is paused? Or should it pause when the scene tree is paused? So then its, it's processing method won't be called. Um, or only update when paused if you want to do the inverse. Like when I pause the game, have a script that wakes up. Um, it's so useful and you can set this per node. The default is inherit, which means do whatever my parent does. Then if they're set to inherit, it'll do whatever the parent does all the way up the chain. But it's extremely useful um, so that you can kind of set up things. So I have a lot of things like, um, you know, when you when we go into the replay mode, like most of the game is paused, but the replay scripts are set to update always and stuff like that. I bet the free cam is probably set to always. I don't know. Yeah, set to always, see. So even if the game's paused, you can free cam around, stuff like that. I really like that system. It's really it's really clever and um, elegant. Uh let's see. Any other any other questions? We're starting to sort of wrap up the stream ish. I got I could go for like another half hour or so, but um if, if there's questions, I'll keep going. If there aren't questions, then, you know, we could wrap up sooner. Um, oh, someone was asking about localization and then I got distracted. Will it support 21 by nine monitors? I mean, yeah, but no. So basically, I've been working on this for about seven months. Uh, so basically, the game will let you run, like, full screen on, like, a silly wide monitor. Um, but it gives you various options for how to fit the gameplay to the to your weird monitor. So in visuals, you can see, um, you can set between three aspect ratios that the game itself will use. 4 by 3 if you really want that classic uh, early, you know, 
early um, 3D console aspect ratio, CRT monitor aspect ratio, 4x3. Um, but you can also set it to 16x9, which is the widest option. And you can set it to 16x10, which is basically for laptops and particularly the Steam Deck, because the Steam Deck is 16x9. And then you can change the scaling mode. Right now it's set to integer mode, which means it will try to pop to the largest integer scale that can fit in your window, but it's going to have a bunch of, you know, empty space depending on the aspect ratio and if it can fit a 2x, a 3x, or a 4x size in your window. Or you can set it to fractional, which will zoom to fit, but will still maintain the game's aspect ratio, which again, is you can only choose from these three. So no, you can't play the game with an ultra-wide view. Um, it's not going to break. Everything will look correct, but the widest mode is 16 by 9. It's mostly just because, like, it's supposed to look like a Sega Saturn game, you know? I don't know. Um, I could I could add another option in here um, to make a wider mode, you know? Um, but, but, yeah. How big are the replay logs? Um, let's look. So here's all the ghosts. Here's all the uh, ghost files. Um, let's, uh, let's go look. Looks like they are anywhere between 50 and 100k kilobytes. Like, I think the largest one is going to be the track. Yeah, Chicago is the longest track. 118 kilobytes. Or a ghost. Certainly probably could be more optimized. But I haven't really worried about it because the file sizes aren't that big. Cheat codes? Yeah, so... Or actually, that reminds me. I wanted to briefly talk about... And, and this this will tie to the cheat codes. Can you zip one? Sure. Uh, let me go back to where I was just a second ago here. I think they are... I'm storing them as like a compressed uh, stream, so I bet they won't get much smaller. Yeah, this actually basically is zipped. It's exact same size. Oh, sorry, you probably can't see that very well. But the, the, the zipped version is the exact same size, yeah. I'm using uh, Godot's like compressed, compressed, uh, what's the thing? I forget, the file. The way you write to a file, you can write in compress mode, which is what I'm doing. So I have put some effort into making the file sizes small. Uh, I was going to show real quick. So this options, the settings screen here, it's kind of cool. Um, you can see like there's all these options that show up and then these uh, every option has like sub options and stuff. Um, I was just going to mention that this is kind of like a good example of a place in the game where I have used... Um, custom resources so I, I could just show that real quick so basically there there's a thing anything that's a setting in the game i made this thing where i say okay i made a new type of resource called a game setting it has a enum that says which setting am i so this is an e, this is the master enum so you can identify different settings and then it has a display name like what's the name to show the player and then what are the options it will pop up in the list when you select that setting. Also, what is the default value? And is the default value different on Steam Deck? Should this value, uh, normally the settings the player choose get saved. Should this one not be saved for some reason? And then when you select an option, should you automatically dismiss the menu or not? And then also, um, should this only show up if there's a feature set on the exporter? So I can make stuff that only shows up in a playtest build, for example. But so anyway, you make these. You make this little script, and then if we look at the game settings, the settings themselves are uh, there's a thing called a setting set, which is also a resource that says I have a name and a list of settings. And so then if you look at my data, we can go to the uh, where is it in the settings. If you look at the gameplay, then over here, this is that thing, and it's got an array of settings that I can just create and set up. So I can add a new setting to the game 
just with data. And then my menu just knows how to loop over this and show text and like, you know, show the values. And when you select a value, set the value, save the value to disk and stuff like that. So like game vibration has just the on off setting, but like ghost names has three options, like none, closest ghost, all ghosts or whatever, or like the leaderboard source, should it come from everyone or should it come from friends or stuff like that? So this is a pretty kind of fun use of just using a custom resource in order to make make some data for my game. Um, and then, yeah, I have a cheat code system. Um, one, one limitation right now Parking. is that because my settings were designed where everything is a name and then some discrete options, right now the volume settings are like discrete options instead of a slider, which is kind of dumb, right? But that's because my data structure is like, it expects there just to be like a finite number of options. So I need to like redo this at some point and add an option for a slider so that volume can be... Also, it's kind of dumb. You have to go in here and make a setting. Like it should just be like a slider right here or something. But um, this fits into my current data structure, which is why it works like this. I didn't plan on this would be a great way to do volume settings. You know what I mean? But it's just like... This is what fits into the way I've laid out the data. Uh, but yeah, and then, yeah, cheat codes, gameplay, cheat codes, enter code brings up a little keypad and you can type in, you know, you can try and type in a, a code and try to turn it on. It'll tell you down here if it accepted it. So I have a whole system where I can say what cheat codes exist and then detect when you type them in and, and then the game code can ask a cheat code system, like, is there a cheat code active right now? Um, so... Yeah, and this, uh, the visual design of this um, setting screen is a, is very closely modeled after the action replay for the Sega Saturn. If you bought the action replay, which is kind of like a game genie or whatever, and plugged it into your Sega Saturn, it, the menu looked almost exactly like this. Uh, so that's kind of a fun little touch, I felt like. How do you get the fonts to render nice and crisp? when dealing with multiple resolution options. Yeah, it's very simple in my case because the whole game renders to a very low resolution. And I use a bitmap font that is a certain size. Um, and I have my whole thing set to um, use point filtering or, or nearest filtering, not bilinear. Actually, I have an option in the, if you want to see what it looks like here. If I go to visuals, here, let's go back to 16 by nine. So here's the game with just like point filtering, right? But you can go here and say, turn on bilinear filtering. And now this is what, everything looks blurry because this is what it looks like if you turn on the normal filtering. Mm. Which is another thing that you can set. Uh, like in a UI node, if you go down to texture, filter, you can see here I have it set to nearest. And I have that set on the top of the hierarchy so that then like ones down here can just use inherit and they will inherit what the parent is set to. Um, so that's pretty simple in my case. Um, I'm not. I'm actually just using uh, bitmap fonts. Um, I found a pixel font that uh, supports all the characters I need for localization because I have Japanese and Chinese and uh, in the game. So the font is pretty big. Here it is. <laughs> See that? <laughs> There's all the characters in the game. Uh, uh, the glyphs, I, could, I should say, maybe. There you go. There's the game font. <laughs> How exactly does coding items for player characters to use work? I've only worked on coding characters because I'm new. Yeah, I mean, normally you would just separate that out. Um... And in Godot, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do that kind of thing. Like, remember, each node in Godot is one thing. It's a rigid body, or it's just a 3D node, or it's a sound player, or it's an animation player, or whatever. So often what you'll do is you might have, like, a child node that's a child of your character, and that node existing it has a script on it that says like this is the double jump or whatever or something and then you write code for that node that just handles the double jump you know and then either and then likely you know the the code up on the character knows to go look at the children and see what abilities there are or you know what other scripts are attached or stuff like that 
Uh, we support, um, what is it? Like 10-ish languages? I think I actually have some bugs with it right now, but let's take a look. So we have English, Japanese, French, Italian, German, uh, Spain, Spanish, Latin American, Spanish, uh, Dutch, Russian, and then see something's busted here. This is Korean. Oh, I know why that's busted. I gotta fix that. Korean, simplified Chinese, and traditional Chinese. So if we switch to Japanese, then then the whole game's gonna be in Japanese. And that is implemented through like a fallback system. So essentially I have my main game font, which looks like like this. This is like the, you know, uh, Roman characters, right? It's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then also like ones with um, accents and other marks for most of the European or Romance languages. And so this is the default font that's set up to be the font that's used in the game. But then if, um, but you can see this font has a uh, where is it? Uh, the font, excuse me, has a fallback that says, hey, if you're trying to show a glyph that's not in this font, try this font. And if it's not in this font, try this font, which this is supposed to get me my Korean. So I'm actually not quite sure why the Korean language name is not showing up properly. Um, and then uh, the translations themselves, I have a Google Sheet. looks like this so there's a google sheet which is like here's the key like the identifier for the text let me make this bigger and then here's the english text and then here's the text for every other language and i pay a company to translate this stuff and then um and then this gets downloaded as a csv file into the godot project so if we look in data localization here's the root csv file and Godot knows how to parse a CSV file, so it turns it into these files here that have the text for each language. This is actually built into Godot. I didn't do anything special. And then by default, which is amazing, I think maybe I can even show this. Will this work in the editor? I'm not sure about this. Let's try it real quick, though. If I make a new scene, user interface scene, and we add a label to it, I don't think it'll do it live. But if I add a label... And we go look at my doc here and see, like, I have a thing called, you know, I don't know, demo by now. So if I put in here, demo by now, um, by default, this thing will, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, localization. So by default, auto translate is turned on. And what that means is that the text that's assigned here, if that text is in here, then it will swap it out based on the language you have set. So right now, if I run this scene, uh, I'd have to save it. We could save it real quick. Just We'll just call this loc demo. So if I run this scene, you see it says buy full version. So and that's like automatic. It's great. If you have a CSV file with columns for languages and you import into your project, it will auto uh, detect which languages you have. And then if you change the locale by talking to the translation server, it will, and you have labels and stuff in your game with the automatic translation turned on. If the value in there matches one of the keys, it will just automatically replace it with the translated text for you. You can also translate stuff in code using TR. So you can see there's place which means it stands for translate. So there's a bunch of places where I do fancier junk in the game where I like, you know, have to generate a more complex string where I say, okay, translate this thing and then format it by replacing this word with this value and this word with this value and stuff like that. So that's all built in. Um, it's really, really easy to use. Um, and Godot supports right to left. So if you want to support Arabic or other right to left languages, it works great. Yeah, I had, for our Unity games, I had written my own code to do something similar, par parse a CSV and do a lookup system and blah, blah, blah. But it's all just kind of like built into Godot, which is pretty awesome. Hello, I'm a Go Godot contributor. What is your opinion on sets being added as another type inside variant? Um, So in addition to an array 
and a dictionary, a set. So my understanding is that a set is like an array, but you but all the values have to be unique, right? So a set or an array, you could have an array with the number seven and then the number seven again and the number seven again and then the number nine. But a set, if you said put in seven, 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 nine, the set would just be I have a seven and I have a nine. Um, that's kind of useful from time to time. I, I think the case could be made that that's pretty useful. Um, it's kind of like a dictionary with no values, just the keys. Um, do you often use particle generators? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I showed some earlier today. Uh, like um, right here. Uh, there's the there's this. These are my cool little particles for when the car is drifting and it's like, yeah, you can do a boost right now. There's that. There's this, which is uh, smoke particles for when you're driving around and uh, sliding through the world. Woo. Um, and these are all using a custom shader to get this like dither effect. But but yeah, I use a lot of um, GPU particles. I like the particle system. It's pretty easy to work with. Takes a little getting used to to figure out exactly like, you know, this process material's got a lot of options and it can be a little intimidating at first, but uh, you just sort of play around with it, try different things, and eventually you can get it doing what you want. It might be kind of nice if the spawn system had a better visualization of like the the, the dimensions and stuff, but it's not it's nothing too too difficult. Mm -mm. Um, let's see. I think I've answered pretty much everyone's questions. Let's do maybe one more quick, uh, quick call for questions. Anybody have, uh, any have questions? Are the headlights done with shaders? Yes. And actually that way I'm doing the headlights are probably kind of, I feel like there's probably a better way to do it. And my my lack of Godot experience means I did it in a very simple way, which is kind of gross. I don't do any real-time lighting. I don't use any Godot light nodes at all. Um, so what that means is that if you look at my shaders here, basically, like, you'll see, like, hey, look, I have a lit shader i have a special one for the cars that has more like the, it can do the colored variants and stuff like that and then like look saturn lit headlight uh or like uh what is there another one that uses the headlight underscore i think there is saturn lit specular car headlight <laughs> so basically i have like a shader that this shader here is like the same as this shader but with support for the headlights added in so this shader is like 99% the same as all the other one, except it has some global uniforms, which are these things, shader globals. So basically what I do is I have a script somewhere that says, where is the headlight? Which way is the headlight pointing? Which cut what's the color of the headlight, blah, blah, blah. So all these values are globals so that any shader can access them and then write, where is it? It's going to be in the vert, right? Because all the lighting is in the vertex. If you look at the frag shader, like there's no lighting happening here. We're just looking up the colors. Um, so this right here, I think, is the headlight stuff. Where I just kind of do a cone and say, are we inside the cone? Then we're bright. If we're outside the cone, we're not bright. And there's a little fall off. Uh, Vazarus, you can check out the game here. There's a Steam page and the game's coming out in September. I'm also doing play testing. A bunch uh through my discord and stuff um but i'm i'm almost done so yeah the choice to use mobile is not there's nothing i'm not actually making a mobile game i just figured uh i didn't need forward plus because i'm not using any real-time lighting i'm not using any global illumination none of that like i just need to draw 3d models with my own shaders 
please. So I just decided to go with uh, the mobile renderer, um, which means I can't support old computers that don't have good Vulkan drivers. And I have seen some players have weird visual artifacts that look like they're related to the Vulkan drivers uh, situation. So I kind of wish I could switch back to compatibility and support OpenGL ES or whatever it is, GL3 or whatever. Um, but I think a bunch of the lighting and the, like the colors get weird when I switch to that. So I don't know. Uh, do you use yield and await and coroutines? Yeah, I do. Let's go see how many times I use the word yield. Oh, await. I use await fair amount. Let's take a look. Um, I, I use a wait sometimes for cheesy stuff like this, where I just need a couple frames to pass before I do something. Don't look, do not, do not write code like this. This is disgusting. You see how gross this is? This is because the scene loads up and a bunch of stuff happens. And then I need to like make sure the nodes exist. And I'm just, this is my like five second way of being like, just wait long enough that the stupid nodes exist or whatever. Let's find a better one. Uh, here's a simple one, fade out music. So I talked about this earlier, but I have two tracks to playing music. So this one's playing right now. When I start new music, I play this track and then I want to fade out the old one. So I get a crossfade. So I like create a tween, tween the volume wait till the tween's done, and then stop the old um, audio player, for example. Uh, look, these look like hacks here, a wait process frame. These are all disgusting hacks. Don't ever do this ever, you know. Uh, here we await a three second timer. Uh, uh, this is a uh, controller room vibration. Why GD script versus C sharp? Oh, I gave a epic 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 explanation of this earlier in the stream um if if anything gets clipped from this stream it will probably be my epic explanation of either that or the epic explanation of um process process versus physics process but feel free to go skim the vod i have a whole section <laughs> where i talked about GD script, but the short version is I came over to Godot. I have tons of C sharp experience, but I visited Godot like I was visiting a new country. And when I go visit a country, I don't want, I don't expect them to be like my home country. I want to see what it's like in the country I'm visiting. And this country called Godot has a thing called GD script that they like. So I wanted to see how the natives do it. And I tried out GD script and um, I didn't bring my expectations of, of C sharp along with me. I was just like the people that made this engine said GD script is cool so how about we try that out and then I tried it out and I like it so I don't I don't need C sharp the await three frames that looks like a good use case for the potential implementation of wait for node yeah although in that case the node I'm waiting for doesn't even it's a programmatically added node by some other script so I don't even know how to tell it what node I'm waiting for you know what I mean? I mean, maybe waiting for the node that in ready does the thing I want it to do or something like that, but yeah. After using Godot with your history and other engines, do you plan to stick with Godot? Yeah. Yeah. Um, unless I was making some really specific project that needed a specific engine of some kind, um, I, I will, Godot will be my default choice. I meant having a great experience with it so far. If I was making some big, really ambitious 3D game, maybe I would wait or something, but I don't make those, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could use a signal for that, for sure. Yeah, it would, that that is a good case. This should be a signal. This should not be in ready. There should be a signal that some other system can notify this thing when it's done doing all of its junk, and then I just run this code as a result of receiving that signal. That's absolutely what this should be this is this is uh just trying to get stuff working and then it worked and then i moved on type code which you will see in shipping games <laughs> for sure uh but yeah use a wait fair amount the setting screen uses it quite a bit uh the setting screen like um for example um if you go to the setting screen see how it's like 
it animates and then it shows the view and then it animates and then shows the next thing and then it animates and shows the view like the little brute, brute, brute. those are all tweens that i'm awaiting them being finished before the code can continue how does godot stay so lightweight with other engines go full call of duty on your ass i don't know that's that's a question for the godot devs they've done a fantastic job the whole engine like you download it, it's like 50 megs or something it's ridiculous uh what is this computer i don't know this computer is this is a pretty recent computer actually oh does dx diagnostics not exist anymore what oh no it does okay uh this is a ryzen 7 3700x with six how many megabytes of ram is that six gig of ram i think or 64 gig of ram 64 gig of ram would make more sense wouldn't it uh and it has a geforce rtx 3060 and a cool custom keyboard that has a little jelly car on it see the jelly car isn't that cool uh let's see yeah that's because there was a green key that my green screen was uh or my yeah the, the green the green screen filter believed was in fact to be erased from existence <laughs> uh yeah you can do exclamation mark project and that will give you a link to the game um all right, so I think we're going to sort of wrap it up. It seems like the big questions have mostly come and gone. Uh, so let me first uh, thank everybody for coming by. Uh, we talked about a bunch of stuff today. We talked about the scene structure, how to do low res stuff, how to do the Sega Saturn style shaders and dithering. I talked about my physics setup and the complete lie that is the physics of the game. We talked about how the replay system works. We showed how you can do localization in Godot. Talked a little bit about multiplayer, talked about Steam integration using Godot Steam, talked about the minimap, debug visualization tools, custom resources, uh, Blender import process, vertex lighting, shaders. And I'm pretty sure we talked about other stuff. Uh, yeah, I think uh, so. we're going to set up a raid here. And uh, Godot Engine Official, a.k.a. Nat, I think has... Yeah, I'm totally on board with that. Uh, Nat, go for it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, in terms of outros, um, I'm really enjoying working with Godot. I stream here on Twitch three times a week, working on my game projects, actively coding, doing level design, doing shaders, etc. Um, uh, please feel free to drop by. Uh, check out the game as well. Um, but also check out the other streamers and people who stream game dev. The community here on Twitch of game devs, regardless of engine, is a super welcoming and super fun uh, community. Oh, uh, Comedy Reflux says... Where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? How far back was it? It says, are you going to... And then how do I, how do I get to it? Oh my god. Oh, are you going to Godocon? No, I would really like to go to Godocon, but I have uh I have kids. <laughs> so um travel is travel is hard to plan and arrange. But uh anyway, yeah, thanks everyone so much. I really appreciate it. Uh feel free to drop by my streams or other streamers. We're gonna raid out to another creator who's using Godot. The bit about process versus physics process was yeah, maybe like 30, 40 minutes ago, I think. There was an on-screen diagram with a bunch of white boxes. If you skip around, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, it was uh, it was detailed. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks everybody. I appreciate it, and I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, raid on out. <laughs>